once I start this, the first thing I see are a whole bunch of templates down here. Now, the first time I saw templates in a Microsoft project was several years ago in Microsoft Publisher. Next time I saw them, it was in the Microsoft for Mac version of Office, where you would start up one of the Mac Office programs and you would see the templates. Now, since 2010, as soon as you start Microsoft Word, you see these templates, and they can be a really cool thing. For example, I've got templates for, let's see, uh, calendars, I've got templates for greeting cards and invitations, uh, personalized letterhead, free panel brochures. So I can look like a uh, design genius, even though I'm just starting with Microsoft Word. I just start with one of these templates. Uh, let me just click on that one for a moment. And it shows me a little preview of it. And if I then click create, and it pulls that one up. Here's what it looks like, and it's pretty formatted. It's got some cool text turned sideways here. It's got some pictures in here. Now you can click on a picture and insert your own. I'm not going to do that right now, but you can see this is a uh, this is a three panel brochure here. Now I'm not quite ready to, for you to do that, but I just want you to see that you can look like a uh, design genius by starting with one of those templates. I'm going to uh, close that one instead, and. I'm not going to say that, and since it's the last document that I have open, that actually closes Word. So now that I have it down on my taskbar, I just point at it again, I click on it once. This time I just want to start a blank document. So I'm going to click on blank document, and here it comes. Why don't you do that much? Put our video on pause. Go start Word. If you don't have Word down on your taskbar, do that thing I did. I clicked on the start button, I searched for Word. When I found it, I right-clicked on it, and on the pop-up menu, I told it to pin it to the taskbar. So, please do that. And then once Word has started, click on the template for blank document, and your screen will look like mine. So, put the video on pause right now, and catch up with you there. Start Word with a blank document, please. All right, let's rock. So, the first thing on our agenda to talk about is kind of a layout of things here called the interface. That's kind of an odd word, interface. Um, an interface is where two systems come together. In this case, it's called the user interface, where Microsoft Word is interacting with you, the user. So I'm going to work my way from top to bottom here in some of the automatic things that are set up in the interface. For example, this area right up here at the very top is referred to as the Quick Access Toolbar. Now, Microsoft makes a database program called Access, but this thing called the Quick Access Toolbar has nothing to do with that. So the Quick Access Toolbar is a place where I can put buttons that I use a lot. So I have the Save button, I have the Undo, I have the Redo. And then I got a fourth little button over here. As I hover over it, it says Customize that Quick Access Toolbar. I'm going to click on that right now. And I see a list of things that I could quickly add to that Quick Access Toolbar. Some of them are checkmarked, namely the Save button, the Undo, and the Redo button. That's the three that are up there right now. I'd like to introduce this thing, touch mouse mode. Now, Microsoft knows that one of the waves of the future is miniaturization. So a lot of people won't be working on a big desktop computer. Maybe they won't even be working on just a regular old laptop computer. Maybe they're working on one of those nice new small tablet computers, like the Microsoft Surface computer. Well, if that's the case, uh, it might be nice to have buttons that are a little bit bigger than this. I don't know about you, but I have kind of fat fingers. So if I'm working on some little small screen, it might be tough for me to use the touch mode and touch on these little buttons and get the one I want. So I'm going to add a choice here called touch slash mouse mode. And it's kind of hard to see it first here, but it looks like a little finger pointing at a button. In fact, let me zoom in on this using some third-party software that I have installed. So here's the button button that I just created, that I just added up there, it looks like a little finger pointing at a button. And um, if I want to turn it on, if I want to switch it over to touch mode instead of mouse mode, I click on that button, and you'll see two choices here, the mouse mode versus the touch mode. I'd like you to watch what happens to the buttons up here when I click on the touch mode. I mean, by boom, notice they get bigger here. And that'll make it easier on one of those little tablet computers when I'm trying to use my fingers to touch on the screen and make things happen. The buttons get bigger, and that's going to make it easier for that. Yes, the trade-off is that it eats into my working space a little bit, but particularly on a small screen, that's a nice trade-off. In fact, a lot of my friends just work with the rear buttons all the time. The 
which makes it easier to work on things for them, and they don't mind the trade off of using a small expanse. So I can go up and turn that off, and we will click on the touch mode and switch it back to mouse mode. All right, so I'd like you to do what you just saw me do. What was that? I went up and clicked on the pull down arrow here about customizing the quick access toolbar. I turned on touch and mouse mode, and then I went and actually clicked on the button and changed it over to touch mode for a moment, and then I switched it back to mouse mode. So you can play with that for just a moment, turning on and off the touch mode versus the mouse mode. Everybody, have at it. Continue with our exploration of the interface. So far, we've seen the Quick Access Toolbar up here at the top. Notice the Quick Access Toolbar also has the title bar, and I haven't saved this document yet, so it's got this generic name, Document 1. Right below the Quick Access Toolbar, we have what are called the Command Tabs, File, Home, Insert, Design. Every time I click a Command Tab, I get a new ribbon. So when I click on the Insert Command Tab, I get the Insert Ribbon. When I click on the Layout tab, I get the Layout ribbon. Now, as I go across the command tabs, every single one of them produces a new ribbon. But there are times when I've seen people lose the buttons down here in the ribbon. Let me show you how that can happen, unfortunately, fairly easily. If I'm working on the Mailings tab, I see the Mailings ribbon. If I click on the Layout tab, I get the Layout ribbon. If I happen to double click on the References tab, no problem, just produces the new References ribbon. Here's a very common mistake. If I point at the tab that's already active and I happen to double click on that, maybe I'm just getting twitchy finger. Oh, holy cow, where'd all my buttons go? Now, in order to get that back, first thing I'm going to think of is, oh, I should probably go click on that again. And sure enough, when I do that, the ribbon reappears. But then as soon as I make a choice on the ribbon and click away, it disappears again. So some people like working in that kind of view because it gives them maybe an extra inch of working space up here towards the top. But it does kind of defeat Microsoft's purpose of taking the things that they think you'll use most often and putting them right in front of your face under the Home tab. So let's talk about how we can manipulate these command tabs and the buttons that appear below them. All of that work can be done up here in the upper right-hand corner. Now, those of you who have been around the Windows operating system for a while, you're used to the Close button. You're used to the Maximize slash Restore Down button. You're used to the Minimize button. And unless you've already been using Microsoft Office 2013, this one right here is a new kit on the block, Ribbon Display Options. And when I click on that, I can see three different choices. One of them is blue right now, and that's the one that's active, Show the Tabs. And I see another one down here about Show the Tabs in Commands. When I click on that, ah, there comes all my buttons back again. And as soon as I use one of them, they won't disappear on me. Let's go look at that choice one more time. I'm going up here where it says Ribbon Display Options. Here's one that will mess people up every once in a while. Auto Hide the Ribbon. So this gives me a full screen document to work on. And then every once in a while, I need to make a choice in the ribbon. So how do I get it back? Well, I've got my Close button here. I have a button that says Ribbon Display Options. And when I click on that, oh, here's my old friend. I'm going to go back there and show the tabs and the commands. Ah, and life is good. So, again, that's something that can happen by mistake if you happen to double click on the tab that's already active. Or you can do it on purpose by clicking on this button to look at all the different choices about how the ribbon could appear. Do you want to see the tabs? Do you want to see the ribbon at all? Do you want to see the tabs and the commands? So again, I'm going to suggest that you put our video on pause here for a moment. And go up there and play with that button. First of all, work across the tabs that are in here. And then go up there and play with that button to see how I can hide the tabs, show the tabs, hide the commands, show the commands, hide the ribbon itself. So take just a moment, put our video on pause, and go play with that spot right there, everybody. All right, welcome back from your play with the information about the tabs and the ribbon. The next thing I'd like to talk about are these command tabs a little bit more. So far I've mentioned every time I click on a command tab, I get a new ribbon. Just some of the other terminology here. Inside the ribbon, you will see the buttons grouped into what are called groups of buttons. So for example, under my home tab, I have the clipboard group. I have the font group. I have the paragraph group. 
then by hovering over each of the buttons, I can get them to tell me their names. And sometimes I'll even see a keyboard shortcut. For example, when I hover over the B, it says, oh, that B stands for gold. And it says there's a keyboard shortcut, Control and B. Now I can either turn on the bold before I type or after I type. We'll be doing all of that pretty soon. So every time I click the Command tab, I get a new ribbon. The ribbon is broken down into groups of buttons. Here's the Paragraph group. Here's the Styles group found under the Home tab, which produced the Home ribbon. And then every once in a while in one of these groups, they will give you one of these guys, a little down pointing right arrow. I hover over it, it gives me a way to further customize things that I'm seeing on screen. Its official name is a dialog box launcher. Sometimes in our company we call it the black hole in time because when I click on it, very often I am taken to a window that I might recognize if I had been around Word for a long time, maybe back to the 2003 version of Microsoft Word, this used to be the way to modify my fonts. So again, pretty much every time you click on one of those dialog launchers, you will be going into an old school window, whether you realize it or not. Maybe you weren't using Word back in the day, or this looks familiar to you, but just be aware that it's another way to do many of the same things that you have in the group of buttons up here. For example, I see this is the paragraph group, and I've got stuff about adding bullets or adding numbers to my lines, indenting and outdenting setting line spacing options. And if I click on the dialog launcher here, oh look, I've got left aligned, right aligned. I've got line spacing options in here. It's just another way to do several of the same jobs that are already available in the groups and buttons right up here. And sometimes there's extra choices in this dialog window that there isn't a button for up in the main part of the ribbon. So that's how you can get to the dialog launchers just the terminology. The command tabs produce ribbons. Ribbons are broken down into groups of buttons. Many times the buttons have pull down arrows with further choices. And every once in a while they'll give you one of these dialog launchers that's a down pointing right arrow. With our exploration of the interface, I'd like to mention that one of these tabs is not like the others. One of these tabs is not the same. One of these, come on, everybody. Oh, they were not all Sesame Street fans. Um, the tab that I'm talking about right now is the File tab. So right now, every one of these tabs produces a new ribbon. But if I go over here and click the File tab, welcome to this totally different view here called the Backstage View. So you see, they've got a nice list here of recently used files. The first time you open your Microsoft Word, you probably won't have any files over here. I also have my personal OneDrive that's online storage. I have other web locations. I have this PC. When I click on this PC, then I will see recently used folders as well as recently used documents. And if the thing that I want isn't in any of these folders, isn't any of these documents, I can simply browse for the file that I want to open. And then I can navigate through my hard drive. I can navigate through shared drives in my corporate network, and so forth. So this is how you can open a file that exists already. For the moment, I'm going to click Cancel. Microsoft says this backstage view is where you do things to your files rather than in them. And many of those things I see listed over at the left-hand side. For example, I can open a file. If I click on New, Oh, look, there's those templates we were seeing when we started this program. If I click on the Info button on the left-hand side, I can see some information about protecting the document, inspecting it, some properties. Some of these are automatically set up. Some of them are things that I can fill in. Over here on the left side, I can open a file. I can save a file. I can take the file that's already got a name and save it as a different name. I can click on Print here, and I'll actually see a print preview of my document. Oh, that's pretty exciting so far. I don't have anything in it yet. And you'll see a whole bunch of settings that I can choose on the left-hand side for doing my printout. I'm not quite ready to do that yet. You'll see that I can share this document with others. There's another big trend of the future, collaboration with other people on a document. Maybe you have to run it by the legal department. Maybe you have a couple of people in your department who are experts in various parts of what this document is about. So you could save it to the cloud somehow, either through OneDrive, 
or if your company uses SharePoint, then you would be able to share this with people, and you could control who could do what in it, and then you could have multiple people working on it at the same time. Also in my bad stage view, I see choices about exporting to other file types. Maybe I want to change it to an older version of Microsoft Word, because I'm dealing with somebody, you know, one of my customers, who still only has the 2003 version of Microsoft Word. Quite frankly, that doesn't happen very often anymore because it's 10-year-old software, but every once in a while. Here's a place I can close my document. There are some other options in here that we'll talk about how you can uh, decide where things are going to get saved and how they're going to look and so forth. Now, to step out of the next stage view, all you have to do is go up here and click on the back button, and now you're back into the normal view. You've got the command tabs and the quick access door button. Look down towards the bottom of the screen. I have this bar down at the bottom. This is called the status bar. And I can see what page I'm working on. I can see how many words are in there. Again, not too exciting just yet. You might be able to see a section number. Down here at the bottom of my screen is another important part of my Word interface. This is called the status bar. On the left hand side, I can see what page I'm working on. I can see how many words are in my document. Okay, that's not too exciting so far. Over on the right hand side, I see several different views that are available. And at the far right, I see ways to zoom in and zoom out on this document. So I've got a minus sign on this end. Every time I click on that, it zooms me out so I can see more of the document. Once I have text on there, it will be harder to read the text as I zoom in and zoom out. Over here on the right hand side, I click on the plus sign. I can zoom in. You can even see percentages over here as to how much I am zoomed in. And you might notice this slider goes back and forth as I click the plus and minus signs. I can actually grab that slider and drag it left and right. I can pass out the grammar mean to anybody who's got any motion sickness going on there. But you know, I gotta tell you, if I have a mouse with a scroll wheel on it, I hardly ever go down here to zoom in and out on my document. Right now I'm sitting at a computer that has a scroll wheel on its mouse. And as I roll that scroll wheel, it lets me scroll up and down the document. Here's the bottom of the page, now I'm going the other direction, here's the top of the page. But if I hold the control key while I'm rolling the scroll wheel, it quickly zooms me in and out. And this is not just a word thing. This happens all across the office suite and in a lot of different programs. Maybe even several of the programs on the Adobe side. Um, and by using control in the scroll wheel, I don't have to get down to some little increments thing down here in the bottom right corner to be able to zoom in and out. We're going to start entering text, and then we'll need to start talking about formatting various things. Now we're going to be discussing things that will format the entire document, or just a paragraph, or just a word, or words and sentences and paragraphs that I have pre-selected. But let's start out with kind of a big thing here. Let's talk about something that will affect the entire document. And this is going to be available under the Layout tab. So I'm going to click the Layout tab, producing the Layout ribbon. And one of the things that I get to choose in there is the orientation of my paper. Right now I'm going to use the Control and Scroll Wheel method for zooming out, so maybe I can see the entire page here. And then under my Layout tab, I'm going to click on the orientation of the page. And I get two choices. Right now I'm in Portrait Orientation. I have another one called Landscape Orientation that turns the paper sideways. Now this depends on what kind of a document I'm trying to create. For example, maybe a certificate of completion, I'd like to have it sideways with really big letters on it. But maybe for a business letter, I'd like to have the orientation in portrait orientation so that I can do my typing and it will look more like a business letter. One of the other things I can change in here is the actual paper size itself. And of course, that means that I have to have a printer that will print on these various sources. Legal size, executive size. So let me zoom out a little bit more here so that we'll be able to really see the differences. When I change the paper size to legal, for example, you can see it got quite a bit taller all of a sudden. And if I turn that one to landscape orientation, I'll notice that there is a trade-off. When I go to landscape orientation, I gain width, but I lose height. So, um, you know, pay attention to that. That will be part of the thing that you'll want to set up probably before you start typing. You can change it afterwards, but it's better to plan ahead as to what you want this thing to look like. So I'm going to go back to the 8.5 by 11 letter paper size, and I'm going to go back to the portrait orientation. Why don't you just take a moment, put our video on pause, 
and play with that for a minute. That was under the layout tab, and we were changing the paper size and the orientation. So put our video on pause, and then come on back, and we'll continue with this discussion. Welcome back. It's time to get in and get our hands dirty. So I'm going to be zooming in so that when I type stuff, I'll actually be able to read it. And it's going to be a memo to people in a particular department. So I'm going to start typing that. M-E-M-O. I'm holding the shift key to get all capital letters. And then once I'm done typing that, I hit the enter key and it will jump down to the next line. And then maybe this is going to be who I'm sending it to. I'm going to say it's to. The people in the training department. Okay. Hit the other key. It jumps down and starts another new line. I'm going to put in who it's from. Every time I hit the other key, it jumps down and starts a new line. You'll see that there's some nice line spacing. It makes things a little bit easier to read, not all clumped up. Now, every once in a while, I'll forget to put something in. Now, you may have noticed every time I hit the enter key, the cursor, that's the name of that flashing thing there, jumps down and starts a new line. But there are times when I want to take stuff that I've already typed and kick it farther down the page, and this is going to be one of those cases. So, to do that, I'm going to click right up here to put my flashing cursor in front of the word 2, and when I hit the enter key, it takes everything following that cursor and kicks it down, and then I can hit the up arrow and I can put in today's date. By the way, any of you who love keyboard shortcuts, Microsoft Word has a nice keyboard shortcut for putting in today's date. It is Alt and Shift and D for date. So right now I'm holding the Alt and the Shift, and while I'm holding them, I'm typing D for date, and lo and behold, there is today's date filled right in there. So I think this would be a good place for you to put the video on pause and do what you just saw me do. Remember, I typed the word memo, I hit the enter key, I put in the to line, I hit the enter key, I put in the from line, I hit the enter key, and then to move the word to, I click to put my cursor just in front of it, I hit the enter key to kick it down, and then to fill in the date. Does anybody remember what the keyboard shortcut was for the date? I know, I hope some of you are shouting, why well, again, it's Alt and Shift and D. It's your turn to try that. So put the video on pause. Catch up with me, everybody. Okay. I'm hoping you're having some fun learning how to set up your text. So next thing I'm going to do is click right after my name, and I'm going to get the cursor to kick down the page. Now, if I try to get the down arrow key, it will only go as far as where I've hit enter so far. And then if I need to go even farther down, then I need to hit enter more times. I'm going to leave a little bit of extra space. By hitting the enter key one more time, and now I'm going to start my memo. But I think I'd like to be able to read it a little bit better, so I'm going to zoom in. Maybe I'll go down here and click my plus sign a couple of times. Maybe I would use control in the scroll wheel. Right now, I'd like to type something that's not just going to be a little short line. I'd like to type something that's going to be a paragraph or two, and that will let us talk about these margins and how they are the places where your words will wrap. This is not like Rapper's Delight or something like that. Boom, 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 It's just a W-R-A-P, the words wrapping inside the margins. Here we go. So this is a memo to my training department, and it's going to talk about how we teach about Word when we first started up. So when teaching about Word 2016, we want to do this thing, we want to do that thing. So I'm just going to keep typing, and you're going to see the word wrapping happen. I'm teaching about Word 2016, start with the interface. Talk about the Quick Access Toolbar, the Ribbon, the Autumn Status Bar, and how to turn on the rulers. Oh, it just automatically word wrapped right there. I did not hit the enter key to start a new line. That's an example of word wrapping. You zoom in on that a little bit more so you have a better chance of reading it. You have a better chance of reading the whole thing. So I'd like you to catch up with me. Do what I have done. Type this uh, paragraph so you can see it word wrapping in there. 
and then we'll come back and work together on some more. So, now we've been talking about entering the task. Sometimes you realize you've made mistakes, or you've forgotten something, or you should have used a different word somewhere. So now we're going to start talking about editing text that exists already. So for example, maybe I would like to get rid of the word Dan and replace it with something longer. So one way I can do this is to click to put a cursor right after the N in Dan, and maybe hit the backspace key to take those letters out one at a time. And then in their place, I will type in Daniel, and add my middle name, James. And you'll see as I do that, the words that are there already, they just move over and make room for that. So that flashing thing is called the cursor, or another name for it is the insertion point. And you've just actually seen why they might call it the insertion point. Now, that's one way to do that. Erasing one thing and then typing another thing in its place. But we have a little saying around here. We say, you need not erase to replace. So maybe, for example, I want to replace the word word with something more general. Talk about not specifically Word 2016, but the whole Office suite when teaching about Office 2016. So here I'm going to talk about you need not erase to replace. I'm just going to select the word word by dragging across it. And then in its place, I'm going to type the word office. And you'll see how it just automatically puts that word right in there. And any word wrapping that's going on at the end of the line, it's just going to automatically take over and wrap down to the next line. Maybe I'm realizing that not everybody's going to know what the QA toolbar is. So maybe I need to spell that out. Quick access toolbar. So I'm going to click to put my flashing insertion point right there. And I'm going to start typing the rest of the word quick. Leave a little space. Hit the right arrow key to move past the A and add the word access. By the way, that has nothing to do with the database program called Microsoft Access. It's just the official name for this area right up here called the Quick Access Toolbar. All right, so you can see how it automatically rewraps the words as we do that. So why don't you just, just take a moment and go in and try some of the things you just saw me doing. I erased a word and then typed another word in its place. And then I went and selected a word and typed another word in its place without erasing it first. So put our video on pause, go do that in just a little bit. Maybe you're typing something different than what I'm typing. That's fine, that's okay. You can work on the kind of memo that you would be writing, and that way you're practicing stuff that you'd be more familiar. So put our video on pause, take just a moment, play a little bit with the editing. You can erase something and type something else in its place, and then try one where you select a word and type another word in its place without erasing first. So put our video on pause and try that. Okay. Let's continue typing. So I'm going to click right here after the word rulers, or whatever is your last word. Hit the enter key a couple of times, and then let's put in a closet. How about a uh, sincerely, enter key, and then fill in your name. Please pause the video and do that. And then we'll be ready to save this document. All right, good work. Let's go talk about saving this thing now. As I look up in my quick access toolbar, I have this little object. It's supposed to look like an old floppy disk. Or I can go to my file tab and go to the backstage view and save in there. Click the back button. And I hover over that floppy disk. It says, okay, it's used to save. And it might be a little bit hard to see, but it does say Control and S is the keyboard shortcut for that. In fact, let me use some third party software to zoom in on that even more. Keep the little tool tip as I zoom in. So again, it's probably a little bit hard to see because it gets miniaturized on your screen, but the save command keyboard shortcut is control and S. So I'm going to go click on that little save button. And you notice the window that pops up says save as. Now, when you save the file in the first place, obviously there's no difference between save versus save as. The save as specifically comes in if you decide that you want to save that document under a different name. So maybe you've got a document that looks one way, and then you've made some changes to it, and you don't want to lose the original by clicking save to destroy the original and put the new one in its place. You might be able to choose save as, and that way give it a slightly different name or put it in a different folder, and then you'd have a before version and an after version. But when you're saving it for the first time, there's no difference between save versus save as. Now I get to choose where I want to put it, and you might notice 
that by default it's ready to put it on the cloud. So this is another one of those things that Microsoft realizes is the wave of the future, collaboration and storing things in a place where not only can I get to it on all my different devices, maybe my Windows Phone, maybe my tablet computer, maybe my desktop computer, that's one of the things that putting a document on the cloud is good for. Also for collaboration, give somebody else permission to work on that document on the cloud with you, and that way you can be both working on it at the same time. That's a little bit down the road as far as our lesson is concerned. In my case, I would like to just save it on my computer here. So I'm going to click on this PC. Right now I have two just automatic choices, the My Documents folder or the Desktop. Now in most cases, you would store things in the My Documents folder. That's what that's for. But in my case, I'd like to make a little folder for my finished files out on my Desktop. So I'm going to click on Desktop. I'll make a little folder for finished files. I've got one for Word sample files. We haven't looked in there yet, but we will pretty soon. I would like to make a new folder. Luckily, there is a button right here that will let me create a new folder. So that's where I'm headed right now. Create a new folder out on my desktop. Makes a new folder named new folder, but its name is all highlighted, which means I can type right over top of it. And I'll call it finished word documents. Now, you can feel free to drop yours in the My Documents folder, but I would still recommend make a new subfolder, make a new folder, and name it finished word documents. I happen to be putting mine out on the desktop, you can see here. And then by default, it takes whatever is in the very first line and makes that the name of the file. Now, you can override that. You can drag over the name here and name it something else. But in my case, memo, oh, it seems like a decent name for it. So I'm going to make sure I put it in my finished Word documents folder by double clicking on the finished Word documents folder. So now you can see that I'm actually standing in that folder that's on my desktop, that's under my name, that lives in the house that Jack built. And I'm going to finish saving that by clicking the save button right down here. change anything in the document, but as I look up in the blue title bar now, it says the name of my document. Now you may or may not see the four-letter file name extension up here, memo.docx. That's not actually a Word thing, that's a Windows thing. So if we have time to do it, maybe we'll talk about how could you get the four-letter extension to show up, but right now it's not important. So take a moment and save your file. Again, the way I did that, I clicked on File and Save, or I clicked on the little floppy disk icon. And then I made a folder to put it in. So I went to File. Right now, if I choose Save, it won't ask me what to name it because it's already got a name. If I were to click on Save As, maybe I can see more information. So I changed it from OneDrive to this PC. I went to the Desktop. I made a new folder that I named Finish Word Documents. I had to type that name and hit the Enter key to actually stand in that folder. I kept the same name. You can change it if you like. I just might be named Memo. When I hit the Enter key, it saved it right into that folder. If I click Save again right now, it just replaces the old one with the new one. All right, so your turn. You're finishing off your letter, and you're saving it, and you're creating a folder to drop it into. So catch up with me there, everybody. So far, we're talking about entering text, editing text, saving our document. I'd like to show you something in the background. Not the backstage view, but something that's happening that you just can't see. Some of you may be old enough to remember the old Wizard of Oz with Judy Garland, where they walk in and they catch the guy who's actually the wizard, and he says, ignore the man behind the curtain. I'm going to show you behind the curtain right now. You can go to the Home tab, and I'd like to introduce this object right here. It kind of looks like a backwards P. I've heard different names for it. Paragraph symbol, hard return. I recently read its official name. It's called a Pilcrow, P-I-L-C-R-O-W. If you would like to impress your geeky friends later this week, tell them that you were studying a Microsoft Word class and you learned about the Pilcrow. Don't tell them what it is, P-I-L-C-R-O-W. You just tell them you learned about it, and they'll be all curious, and they'll go look it up. 
You'll be real disappointed when they find out what it is, but you will have kept him busy for five minutes looking up the ill crow. Pretty sure you want to actually go. So as I hover over it, it says, show our hive, and then it's got the pill symbol. So I'm going to actually click on that, and oh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that suddenly appeared. A whole bunch of little pill crows. Think about where that pill crow symbol is, and what we did right at that spot. You'll realize that that pill crow symbol signifies every place where we hit the enter key, also called a hard return. So we type in memo, we hit the enter key, it jumped down and created the next line. We put in today's date, we hit that enter key. So every place that there's one of those pill crows, there's an enter key. Notice here there's a pill crow ending this paragraph, and then another pill crow leaving a little blank gap between the two paragraphs there. Also notice where it did the word wrapping, there is no pill crow there. Just automatically wrapped at the margin. And if it can't fit a whole word in there, it doesn't hyphenate it by default. It carries the whole word to the next little line here. So if you don't see a pill crow, it means that you got word wrapping, not enter keys. And anytime I needed to finish off a line that wasn't long enough to word wrap, I needed a pill crow right there. I needed an enter key there. Now, one reason I'm telling you about the pill crow is because the next document that we're going to open, yes, I said open a document that exists already, um, we're going to go look at pill crows in there and see that they explain a couple of things. So, so make sure you have saved the latest version of this document so far. And then let's go open a document from things that we downloaded earlier. So you can leave this document open, and I'd like you to just watch for I'm going to go up and click on the file tab, go to that backstage view. In here, I'm going to tell it I don't want a new document. I want to open a document that exists already. I'm going to click the open command. And back at that same window, this looks very much like my save window, only now you can see I am opening a document, not saving it. And the document I want to open is on this PC. It's not on the cloud. I'm going to click on this PC. And that gives me certain folders that I've been to recently, including the My Documents folder. But we haven't actually started anything in the My Documents folder. So instead, I would like to be able to get out to the desktop. But I might be able to find that by scrolling down in this list of places that I've worked recently. But I can actually make that job a little bit easier if I just go down here and click on the Browse button. So when I click on Browse, it assumes I want to work on my PC. The first place mine is looking is the finished Word document because that's the last place I was working. That's not where I stored my downloaded files. I put them in a folder out on my desktop. So I'm going to grab this scroll box right here and scroll up so that I can go to my desktop. And then inside there, I'm going to go find my Word sample files. I don't know how many of you work in a corporate location where you often have a shared folder where you interact with files that are used by everybody. Maybe that's an H drive, or an N drive, or an S drive. And sometimes you have to go to that drive, and then you have to go into a folder, and then you have to go into a little subfolder. I'm going to show you a way that can make life easier for those kind of things. It's not going to make life a lot easier for us, because I'm only saving myself one step. But I want you to notice this area over here called the Favorites area. Anything that I put over there, I can get to with a single click. For example, maybe I would like to be able to get to my Word sample files, um, for any time I need to open one of these downloaded files. So I'd like you to watch my screen. I'm going to grab the Word sample files, and I'm dragging it to the left. And at first, I get this little red Ghostbusters slash there. I'm just brave. The Ghostbusters slash will disappear. And then I can make sure to drop it between folders over here. I want to be careful not to drop it on a folder. Otherwise, I'm not actually making any kind of quick shortcut. I'm just going to put one folder to another. So I'm looking for this little horizontal line. I let go, and now I have a quick way to get to my Word sample files. That'll be handy for opening files. And then I've also got my folder here about finished Word documents, and that'll be handy when I'm saving files. So I'm going to drag that one over to my favorites area as well. So I'm going to have my Word sample files there. I'm going to have my finished Word documents there. And then I'm going to go click on Word sample files. Why don't you put the video on pause and do what you just saw me do? Let me remind you of how I got to that whole thing here, and then it's going to be your turn to try.
So I'm working on this document, but I want to open a different one. So I'm going to go to the File tab, I'm here in the Backstage View, I'm going to click on Open a Document. I'm going to navigate my browser on my own computer. I'm going to head to, at first, I had to go to my desktop to be able to see the folder called um, Word Sample Files. And then I grabbed that folder and dragged it over here and dropped it in my favorites area. And then I grabbed the finished Word document folder and dragged over here and dropped it in my favorites area. So go join me. When you come back, we'll all be sitting right here ready to open that, the next document. So put the video on pause and do those things. Make a couple of folders over there in your favorites area, and then we'll pick up right here. Good work, everybody. And just be aware, any time that you miss a step, you can always rewind the video and let you know if you missed it. All right, so now that I've got a couple of things over here in my favorites area, I'm going to go over here in my Word sample files. And then on the right-hand side, on this alphabetized list, I'm going to scroll down to find one named Practice Large Documents. And once I find that, I'm going to point at it. I can click on it once and then click Open. Or if you've got a good steady hand, you can point at Practice Large Document and just double click on it. Tap, tap. And it should pop open looking like this. Now you notice it looks a little bit funny here. That's because we opened a document that we downloaded from the web, and it's not considered a trusted location. And right now I can scroll left and right. This is great for those tablet computers. I'm holding it in my hand and then I can use my thumb on the side of the computer to scroll from page to page this way. But I won't be able to edit it. In order to do that, you can see up here in the yellow bar, protect the view, be careful, are you really sure you trust this? And if I want to be able to change anything in it, I have to click on Enable Editing. It looks a little bit more like a regular document. And because I've got the pilgrims turned on, I can actually see a bunch of those there. So this would be a good time to go open that file. Let's see, you created the shortcut over on the side of your screen there. And so now in Word, you go to File, you go to Open, Browse, and then drag the folders over here so they can get to them quickly. And you go to the folder named Word Sample Files, so you click get you there. On the right-hand side, scroll down and find Practice Large Document, and then double-click on it. And then we'll be ready to go to the next chapter of our lesson. So, catch up with me. Remember, you'll have to click on a yellow bar that says Enable Editing. By the way, when you get there, if you just see a blank document and you don't see the pilgrims, you can turn the pilgrims in the line right here. It was in the middle of the All right? So, go up on that document, and we'll see you in the next chapter. So, here we are. Looking at our document, having clicked on Enable Editing. And if you haven't turned on the pilgrims, do that now. So now if I start using my scroll wheel to scroll down, I can see I've basically got a blank page. And I have a title, and then another title, and then paragraphs. By the way, when I mention the word paragraph, what I'm talking about is everything between pilgrims. So here's a Pilcro, and here's a Pilcro. Everything between there is a paragraph, according to Microsoft Word. Sometimes paragraphs are very short. Here's a Pilcro, and here's a Pilcro. This is a four-word paragraph. This is a, I don't know, 30-word paragraph, and so far. As far as Word is concerned, a paragraph is everything between the Pilcros, not just you switching gears and talking about a different subject. That's going to be really important when we start talking about formatting. Because when we talk about formatting a paragraph, we are talking about formatting everything between the two All right, having said that and beaten that horse to death, let us scroll to the top of the document where you see all these pilgrims. What I want to do is remove them. I want to remove those pilgrims and the stage break. Now, one way to do that would be to hit the delete key over and over again. Here I'm tapping the delete key. That got rid of one of my pilgrims. Here I'm tapping the delete key again. That got rid of one of my other pilgrims. But we've also seen that you can drag to select text and tap the delete or backspace key just once and erase all those things at once. So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to drag to select the pilgrims. I'm dragging straight down and straight down to include the page break. And then tap the delete key. All the rest of it moves right up there. Our turn to try that. So I'll put the video on pause. You're going to select all those pilgrims and the page break there on the first page. 
tap the delete key to get rid of them, and then your document should work like this. So join me and remove those pill cards, please. So now that we've got our document looking like this, why don't we hide the pill cards? Sometimes they kind of get in the way. We want them to trim off the pill cards, now it just kind of looks like a regular document. And I'm not noticing that these letters look different than these letters. And that's because they have a different font and a different size. Anytime you're trying to figure out, so what's the name of this font and what size is it, you can click in the middle of such a section and then go look up here under your home tab, specifically in the group called font. In this case, I can see that the name of this font is Arial and that its size right over here measured in 70 seconds of an inch called points, 14 70 seconds of an inch, 14 point tall font. When I click down here on food for your mind, same thing, aerial font, 14 point size. But I can see that things are different down here in this paragraph. When I click down there, gee, what font is being used down there and what size is it? Look at my screen, answer the question before I tell you. The font is named Times New Something, kind of hard to tell exactly what that is. And the size is 12. So you notice these letters are not as tall as those because those ones up here are 14 size, and the ones down here in this big paragraph are 12 size. So we're going to put our video on pause for just a second. Try that little trick. Click in the midst of a bunch of letters, look to see what font and what size it is, and then click down in the paragraph down here and notice that it is a different font and a different size. So put our video on pause and catch up with me in that uh, discussion. This document, you can see its name up in the title bar, Practice Large Document. I also see the words Compatibility Mode. Need more information than you need to know right now, but anytime you see the words Compatibility Mode, it means that that document was created in an older version of Microsoft Word, either the 2003 version or even earlier. Anytime you see that thing up there in the title bar, it says Compatibility Mode. That's what it means. Now, you'll never, ever have a problem using the new program to look at a file created in the older version of the program. The problem would happen is if you made this document in the new version of the program and then emailed it as an attachment to somebody who was still using Word 2003, they wouldn't be able to open that document. So you never have a problem using the newer program on an older file type. That's the good news here. We're going to be using this document through several of our lessons. So what I'd like to do right now is make a copy of this document by using the Save As command. And in this case, not only am I going to change the name of the file, but I'm going to change the folder that it's in. Right now it's in the downloaded folder. I would like to make a copy of it in our finished uh, files folder. So here we go. I'm going to go up to my file tab. This time I really need to choose Save As. If I click on Save or if I click on the little floppy disk icon, all I will be doing is saving it under the same name in the same place. There is no little quick button up here for Save As. There is a keyboard shortcut for it, if you care. It's the F12 um, function key. I'm not going to use that right now, but I'll just keep tossing in these uh, keyboard shortcuts. Again, F12 is Save As. So instead, I'm going to click on the File tab. Here I am in the Backstage view. I'm going to click on Save As. I'm going to browse. That by default it's ready to put it back where I opened it from the word sample files. I actually want to put it in my um, finished files folder. Luckily, I have a nice little shortcut for that over in my favorites area. So I'm looking for my finished word documents folder. I click on it, and then down here I'm going to change its name from practice large document to working large document. That is, I'm dragging across the word practice and replacing it with the word working. Okay, I'm not actually in the document. I am naming the document, but that same method for selecting one thing and typing in its place, hey, that works here as well. Again, don't worry if you don't see the .docx on the end of that. It's too early to talk about that. Don't worry about it if you don't see it. All right, so I'm changing its name to a working launch document. I'm changing where I'm going to put it. I brought it in from Word sample files. I'm now saving it in finished Word documents. And I finish that off either by hitting the enter key or clicking the save button. And you may notice on my screen right now, let me magnify that. I'm getting a little 
notice that says your doctor will be upgraded to the newest file format, which means I won't be working in compatibility mode anymore. Now, if what I want to do is edit this document and then send it back by email attachment to somebody who is still using 2003 version of this, then you can see I would need to make a change here. Instead of choosing OK, I would have to do this. Now watch my screen for just a moment. I'm not going to have you do this, but here's what I would have to do. I'd have to click on Cancel. And then right down here where it says it's going to save it as a Word document, this is a list box. There's a list arrow here. If I click in that list box, one of my choices is to save it as a Word 97 to 2003 document. And again, you might not see the file name extensions on the end of your documents, when a 2003 file would end in .doc, whereas a normal now Word document would be .docx. By the way, if you don't see any year number attached to that, you're supposed to just understand that means the squeaky shiny new version of that. Okay, so backing out of there, um, I am going to save it as a Word document, which is the default choice. And I'm saving over here into my finished Word documents. And I'm changing its name from practice large document to working large document. So I'd like you to do the same. This little message that says you're now going to have this in the 2007, 2010, 2013, 2016 file format. It uses the same format for all of those. I click on OK or hit the enter key. So here's my new name up in the title bar, working large document. Notice it no longer says compatibility mode. So your turn to do that. You're going to use the Save As command. Use F12 if you want the keyboard shortcut. You have opened it from the downloading folder. You're going to save it into the Finished Word Documents folder, and you're changing its name from Practice Large Document to Working Large Document. All right, catch up with me there, everybody. We've got that one document that's a little bit larger than we've been working with. Let's talk about navigating around in this document. Now, the name of it says Working Large Document, but as I look in the lower left-hand corner here, it's really a three-page document, so it's not like the thing is really huge here. Let's talk about navigating slowly up and down. I can use my mouse to move over here into the scroll bar, and I can click on the down pointing arrow. So notice, if I click to put my flashy insertion point over here at this space, and then I move to the bottom of the scroll bar and click on the little arrow. I'm moving my view down, but I'm not moving the cursor down. If, on the other hand, I go to the keyboard and I start tapping the down arrow key, at first I am moving the cursor. But when the cursor gets to the bottom of the screen and I keep hitting the down arrow key, now I'm actually scrolling down. The difference between that and using the arrows on the scroll bar is using the arrows on my keyboard moves the cursor as it scrolls, Using the arrows on the scroll bar doesn't move the cursor, it only moves my viewpoint. Um, I can move a little bit faster if I hold the control key and start tapping up and down arrow keys. Now, uh, first it's a little bit tough to figure out how does it decide where it should stop. Well, I can solve that riddle if I turn on the bloopers. So here I am at the beginning of the paragraph with my cursor. Control down arrow key, move to the next filter. Next pill crow, control down arrow key, control down arrow key. Next paragraph, next pill crow. Beginning of the next paragraph, next pill crow. So that's going a paragraph at a time when I'm holding the control key and tapping the down arrow key. What if I want to move a whole screen's worth at a time? Well, if I move my mouse over here, I notice this scroll box that I can grab and drag in the scroll bar. But if I want to go a whole screen at a time, I can put my mouse under the scroll box in the scroll bar and click and it will jump down one screen at a time. Now, I don't need to move the mouse right below the scroll box. I can move it way down here, and then every time I click, it goes one screen at a time until it catches up to me. I can also do that with a couple of keys on my keyboard. There's a key on my keyboard marks page up, and every time I tap that page up key, it is just like clicking above the scroll box in the scroll bar. I move one screen at a time. Notice the page up and page down key don't necessarily move me to the bottom of the next printed page. They move me to the bottom of the next screen's work. As far as whether I get to the bottom of the printed page, that's dependent on how far I am zoomed in and zoomed out. So the keys that say page up and page down names are a little bit misleading. They really should be called screen up and screen down.
So why don't you just take just a moment and try out some of those methods that I've been using. Grabbing the scroll box, clicking above or below the scroll box, using the down arrow key to move the cursor, using the down arrow on the scroll bar to move your viewpoint without moving the cursor, control and up arrow, control and down arrow to move one paragraph at a time, and then the page up and page down keys to move one screen at a time. So please put your video on pause and try each of those things that we've been talking about. Then when we come back, I'm going to start talking about moving within our paragraph. And I'm rolling the scroll wheel to move my mouse up into one of the bigger paragraphs up here. And I'm just going to click to put my cursor right in the middle of the line. You can see my cursor, remember it's also called the flashing insertion point. There's my cursor sitting right there. Now, if I use arrow keys to move up and down, left and right, we've all done that. But I'd like to start talking about a key other than arrow keys that lets me move around in the line. For example, I see a key marked home. When I tap the home key, can everybody see what that did with my cursor? It's all of a sudden right over here at the beginning of the line. There's my cursor. It's not flashing when I zoom in with my third party flashing software there. So that was the home key. It moves me to the beginning of the line. Moving this way with the arrow key, tapping the home key. There I am at the beginning of the line. There's another key, usually real near my home key, marked end. And if I tap the end key, notice my cursor is now over here at the right end of the line. So home moves me to the left, end moves me to the right. Now, what if I want to move all the way to the beginning of the document? Well, I can add the control key. So I'm holding the control key and tapping the home key. So there I am, right in the upper left-hand corner of the first line. So there was home and end, that was control home. How do you suppose I could get to the very end of the document? Probably somebody's saying, hmm, well, maybe that would be control and the end key. I'm going to do that right now, holding the control while I'm holding control and tapping the end key. Bang, there I am right at the last page. I'm now at the bottom of page three of three. So I'd like you to try that. You're going to click in the middle of the line. You're going to test the home key, which goes to the beginning of the line. You're going to test the end key that goes to the end of the line. You're going to try control home that goes to the beginning of the document. You're going to try control end that goes to the end of the document. Try that out for a couple of seconds. Put our video on pause. When we come back, we're going to start talking about selecting objects. Now, one of the ways to select objects, gee, why don't I go to the beginning of my document here? What keyboard combination did I just do with you? Hopefully you're saying right then, you fool, can't you remember anything for two seconds? That must have been control and hold. I knew it would do that. I'm going to turn off the full curves here. This time I want to select text. Pretty much everybody knows that you can grab your mouse and drag sideways across text. You can drag up and down across text. Using that method, you don't always have to drag to the right and down. You can drag up. You can drag up and to the left. Notice you can move up or down, but not both. From the place that I started, I can move up or down, but not both. A couple other ways that I can select text. If I want to select a whole line, I can move my mouse out into this margin. Now, most of the time when I see an arrow, it points up and left. But notice out here in the margin, it points up and right, and that has a significance. When I click with the up pointing right arrow, it selects that whole line. It doesn't stop at the end of the sentence. It goes to the end of the line. If I move down, and then I hold the mouse button down as I'm dragging, I can select several lines at once, either up or down, but not both. So this time I'm not starting in the middle of the line. This time I'm starting out in the margins to drag up or down to select entire lines, multiple lines. And if I wanted to select an entire paragraph, I can move out here just to make sure I make the beginning of the paragraph and drag straight down, and if I keep dragging down off the bottom, it begins scrolling up to me. So these are ways to select large blocks of text. By the way, there's a way to do that through the keyboard as well, while I'm mentioning it here. Remember how I could use uh, down arrow keys to move my mouse one line at a time, or control down arrow key to move one paragraph at a time? Well, what I'd like you to notice now is if I add the shift key to that, I won't just be moving my cursor, I'll be selecting. So right now I'm holding the shift key, and while I'm holding the shift key, I'm tapping the down arrow key. Oh look, it's as though I had clicked out in the margin. And if I keep the shift key down and keep tapping the down arrow key, 
my cursor, you can't see it flashing, but it is actually moving down in that paragraph, and because I have the shift key down, it is selecting as it goes. What do you suppose would happen if I held control and shift and tap the down arrow key? Not that's what I'm about to do now. Control and shift, I'm tapping the down arrow key. Now it's going a paragraph at a time because of the control key. And it's selecting as it goes because of the shift key. And then I can go up or down from the area that I've started, but not both. I can go one direction or the other. Okay, so it's time for you to try this. It's just like the navigating was, only we're adding the shift key. You can either drag up and down within a paragraph, you can click to get a whole line, you can click and drag to take more than one line, you can use the down arrow key to move your cursor, you can use the down arrow key while you're holding the shift key to select while you're moving the cursor, and if you want to type control and shift and down arrow, you can select entire paragraphs at a time. So now's the time for you to try that, everybody. Last we were talking about navigating, this time we're talking about selecting. And the selecting is going to be really important when we start formatting things, changing the font, changing the color, changing the size of the letters. You must select to affect. So practice your selecting and your navigating for just a couple of minutes. Then we'll come back and we'll start talking about selecting to affect. We come to the first portion of our lesson where it's really important to be able to select because we're going to start talking about formatting things in our document. You must select to affect. That is, you have to tell it what to work on and then tell it what to do to that text. In my case, I'd like to move to the top of the document, so I'm going to use control and hold. Now, let's say that I would like to take this title up here and make it left aligned instead of center. I'd like to move it to the left edge of the paper like this title is. So, first, I need to select it. I could drag across it to select it. But we had a way where you could select an entire line, and to do that, we had to move out here into the margin, so we had the up pointing right arrow. That way, with a single click, I can select an entire line. And notice what popped up on screen. It's called the Mini Formatting Toolbar. Microsoft knows that if you select text that you've already typed, it's usually because you want to change the formatting somehow. So this little mini toolbar has the things in it that people use most often when formatting text that already exists. Notice the B is already turned on here. As I hover over that, it says that's bold letters, extra heavy dark. And you'll notice as I moved away from that quick formatting toolbar, it disappeared and it's not easy to get back. Luckily, all I have to do is go out to my home ribbon and I can get to those things that were in my quick formatting toolbar. For example, um, I said maybe I'd like to move the letters to the left or to the right. Here's some little buttons that will do that. Here's a line left. Notice this one is already selected. That's why these words are centered on the page. And I want to move them to the right side of the page. If I click on that button, there they are over at the right-hand side. Here I am moving them to the left-hand side. Here I am recentering them. How did it know what words to move? Because I had pre-selected them. You must select to affect. That I would like to change the size of those letters. I still got them selected. I'm going to up here to the size box and I can boost them from 14 to maybe 20. By the way, I haven't clicked on 20 yet, but notice I can see what 20 would look like. This is one of my favorite features of the Microsoft Office Suite. It's called Live Preview. I get to see what the thing would look like before I actually click to commit to it. This is a big thing because in the old days, in the old days, we used to select text and we would say, you know, I think that's going to look great as a 28 point font. And then I click on 28 and I go, oh, that's not as good as I was hoping it would look because I couldn't see it ahead of time. I'm thinking, I like purple letters. And so I'm going to choose purple letters and then they look awful. I'm not really doing that yet. But um, again, these are going to be things that I can see in my live preview. If I don't like what I see, I move away from it. If I do like what I see, I go ahead and click on it. So I'm going to make those letters 28 point size. And then if you go up right up here under my whole ribbon in the font group, I've got a way to set the letter color. Now if I just click on that red A right there, I will get red letters. But maybe I want some other color than red. That's what this little sneaky list arrow is about right here. When I click on this, I see several colors. They're divided into what are called theme colors and standard colors. 
we'll be talking about themes in a few minutes. And again, I'm getting that lovely live preview. When I see something I like, I click on it, and then to see what it really looks like, I click away from it so it's not selected anymore. Why don't you take just a second and do that? Select that top title, move it to the left, move it to the right, stand up, sit down, fight, 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 change the size, change the color. Then come on back and we'll do some more formatting together. All right. Let's say that I want to affect multiple lines this time. I've got these little titles at the beginning of several of my paragraphs. And maybe I would like to do something to say three of those at once. Maybe I'd like to turn them into fire engine red or dark blue. Maybe those are my company colors, light green and dark blue. So I'm going to sort of brand this document using the company color. So first I'm going to select this line. And then I'd also like to select this line at the same time. But when I click out in the margin, okay, I've got that second one selected, but I've lost the first one. Now, some of my more experienced Word users might know about the control click trick. And that's what I'm about to do. So first thing I'm going to do is click out here in the margin. There's the first one that I wanted to select. Now I'm going to scroll down with my scroll wheel, and I'm going to move out into the margin next to what is worse and beyond, and I'm going to hold the control key as I click. Oh, look, that lets me choose two things at once. And I can keep doing that. I'm going to scroll down some more. I'm going to hold the control key and click here. And now I've got three things selected at once. And whatever I do next will affect all three of those lines. For example, maybe I go up here and use that same green color that I was using on the title. And if you look closely, the thing that used to have a red bar under the A now has that light green bar under the A. And if I just click on that, oh look, I've got that green down here. But it's your turn to try that. I'm going to select several of those titles. Remember, you're going to click on in the margin. You're going to hold the control key and click to get a second one. Control click to get a third one. And then set the letter color right up here, either through the pull down arrow or by reusing a color that you might have used for the title. Hey, I got it. Catch up, Jimmy. Right there. Work. Work. Let's move down to the end of our document. Remember our old keyboard shortcut by now? Control and the Pilsudski key? No, there's no Pilsudski key. I'm talking about Control and N. Just checking to see who's listening here. So I'm using Control and N to get down to the end of the document. And let's say what I would like to do down here is change the font of this last paragraph. I'm going to select the whole paragraph. Yes, I could drag from end to end, or I could move out in the margin and drag downward, or drag upward, select that whole paragraph. There's a couple other keyboard ways to do that, but I don't want to overwhelm you with things. And what I'd like to do here is change the font. Right now it's Times New Roman. I would like it to look like an old school, I mean an old school typewriter. The usual font on an old school typewriter is called Courier, C-O-U-R-I-E-R. -E Word has a font called Courier New, and I'd like to choose that. So I'm moving up either to my quick formatting mini toolbar, or I can move up to my home ribbon. And I'm going to click on the pull down arrow in this list of fonts. Man, what a list is that. Roll up and down in that list, I can actually see it happening in the background. I've got that live preview thing going on back there. Sometimes it's partially covered up by that list itself. So I'm trying to find a font called Courier New. I'm going to start scrolling down through the alphabetized list. Down to CO, down to COU, there it is, Courier New. I'm hovering over it, and yeah, it looks like an old school typewriter, but I'm clicking on it. So I can change the font, I can change the color. We've got all kinds of formatting features here. Make the font a little bigger, a little smaller. There's a button here that I can make everything uppercase or lowercase. We've got some fancy schmancy word art it's called. All kinds of uh, reflections and glowing features and so forth. Pretty much everything up here in the font group is kind of fun to play with. We have to select the text first. So what I just did was I selected that last paragraph and I changed its font to Courier New. I'd like you to select that last paragraph and I'd like you to just play with it a little bit. Try bold, try italic, try underline, we've got strike through, we've got superscript, we've got subscript, we've got all kinds of cool text effects. I'd like you to just play and make sure you're working on that very last paragraph. We'll give you a couple minutes to do that and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about kind of a cool feature that's available only in Word and PowerPoint, and we'll take advantage of it here in Word. So, so pause the screen, select that last paragraph, 
and in there and play a little bit. When you're done, unpause the screen and we'll start talking about a special feature that's only available in Word and PowerPoint. You can start playing for a minute. Put the video on pause, play around a bit, and then come back. So here comes this new thing. Let's stop for a moment and save our latest document. Come on up and click on that little floppy disk up in the upper right corner. Or maybe you like the keyboard shortcut that is showing me, Control S. Go ahead and click on that. Now we're not using Save As, so it just assumes that we want to keep the same file name and replace the old version with the new version. And then oh, let's close this file. Now one way to do that is to go up here in the upper right corner and click the Close button. Let's go ahead and do it that way. So click that close button to close this document. And when I do that, I can see that my memo document is still open behind there. And maybe I want to turn the pull close off. Alright, here's what I'd like everybody to do. First of all, you're going to watch me do this, and then you're going to join me. So it's a special thing that happens when we reopen a Word document. So I'm going to go to my file menu. I'm going to tell it to open a file. I'm going to slide down here and browse for my documents. Here's the one I was working on most recently, a working large document. I'm going to double click to reopen that. And down here in the bottom right corner. Welcome back! Pick up where you left off. How are we doing so far? Two minutes ago. Hmm. So if I click on that, it takes me right to that place that I was working earlier. The last place. I was working when I closed this document. What is that handy? Because this is a 20 page document that was fixing something on page 12, and I kind of like to pick up where I left off. I can just click on that little button that appeared in the bottom right corner to take me right to the last place I'd been working before I saved that file. How cool is that? So it's your turn to make that happen through you. We recently closed the working large document. Go back up to the file menu, choose open, slide down and click on browse. It should take you to the last folder you were working in, as long as you haven't turned your computer off between then and now. And you should get that little thing appear in the bottom right corner when you go to open that document. And you can click on that little placeholder and it will take you right to this place where you were working now. Okay, catch up with me. We're working at the last part of that document, reopen it and let it take you to pick up where you left off. In our lessons, I mentioned that we were going to talk about different kinds of formatting. Formatting that affects the entire document, formatting that affects just a paragraph, formatting that affects only certain words that I've pre selected. And we've seen a couple of those. We saw formatting the entire document involve maybe setting the orientation. Are we going to go portrait or landscape? What size paper are we going to use? We can set those things up, and those are good to do before you actually start your time here. It can be done afterwards, but suddenly your document like rewraps itself, all of these paragraphs and so forth. So these are things that are good to do fairly early on as far as setting up the entire document. And then recently we saw that we could affect this paragraph by changing its font, for example. But maybe there are other things I want to do to draw attention to a paragraph. Maybe I'd like to indent the size, temporarily increasing the white space and narrowing the paragraph, that is, narrowing where it word wraps as I'm typing. Maybe I want to change the line spacing, how much space there is between the lines in a paragraph. I grew up as a child in the 60s, and back then we had a mechanical typewriter. We didn't even have an electric typewriter where I grew up. So you would put the paper in the roller on your typewriter, and you would roll this, it was called the carriage, you would roll the carriage forward and bring the paper up to where you were going to type. So you would type, and when you finished a line, it wouldn't wrap. You would have to grab this little handle on the typewriter and drag it sideways, and that would roll the clayton up so that you could get to the next line, and it would take that carriage and move it over to the beginning of the next line. By the way, any of you who have done any programming, um, you'll see this term carriage return and line feed. That's an old school term for that stuff I used to have to do on the typewriter. But I digress. I'm also thinking of maybe in elementary school, junior high, uh, we would be assigned to read a book and then we had to write a book report. And very often the teacher would say, I want that to be two pages double spaced. So when we talk about double spacing, we're talking about the vertical distance between lines in a paragraph. And that's what I'd like to talk about now. Now, 
You format in paragraph many times, you don't actually have to select the entire paragraph to format it, depending on what sort of things you're doing. If, for example, I wanted to change the font, as we did, I really did have to select all the characters in the paragraph to change the font. But for things like indentation and line spacing, you just have to click to put your cursor, or again, also called the insertion point, in the middle of such a paragraph. So I'm going to do that with this paragraph right here that starts with books and beyond has always been a place to go for your reading pleasure. So I'm going to click anywhere in that big paragraph. Now remember what a paragraph is according to Word. I'll go up there and turn on the pilgrims under the home tab. So here's the end of one paragraph. Here's a blank paragraph. Here's this paragraph. No pilgrims at the end here, just word wrap. Here's the end of the paragraph. So I'm talking about everything between here and here is this paragraph, and I've just clicked in the middle of it. I'm going to turn the top of off right now. And so what I want to do now is set the line spacing to be what's called double spaced. I notice under my home tab, there's this whole paragraph group up here, and the names don't really show up until you hover over them. But if I look at this one right here, I can see that its name is line and paragraph spacing, and then they try to tell me how this works. So if I click on that right now, I get a little pull down list, and I can see that it's single spaced, but I can make it one and a half spaced, or the dreaded double spaced, even the even more dreaded triple spaced, usually that's kind of overboard, but if my teacher said I needed to do something double spaced, then this would be a nice way to do it. I love that live preview. So I'm going to back out of there, and uh, I haven't actually made that choice, and I'm just going to click away. We're talking about another way that I could get in and look at the line spacing. You may remember our discussions of these little guys, little down pointing right arrows, called the Dialog Launcher. If I click the Dialog Launcher, I am taken to a relatively old school dialog window, where I can set the line spacing right here. Notice many same choices, and some other ones that weren't on that list. Um, I can also talk about indenting left and right. We're going to be doing that in just a moment. So this is a nice window to control a lot of things about a paragraph. For the moment, I'm going to cancel. So I want to switch gears for a second. I want to talk about indenting my paragraph. Uh, again, that's temporarily increasing the white margin space. Well, here's a little button that will do that. I'm hovering over it. It says increase indent. Notice I'm not getting a live preview of that. And when I click on it, oh, look what it did. It indented the left side of that paragraph roughly a half an inch. Now, what if I want to indent the right-hand side of it? Turns out there's no button for that. I see a little button with an arrow pointing the other direction. It says decrease indent. And when I click on it, well, it decreases the indent on the left side of the paragraph. So what if I want to indent both sides? Well, okay, a couple of things we need to talk about there. Now, uh, um, I've also mentioned earlier, left aligned, center, right aligned. There's a fourth one up here called Justified, and I'm going to click on that. And notice how it nicely lines up both the right and left sides of my paragraph. And this way, when I indent, it will be a little bit easier to see that I'm actually indenting that thing. There's no quick button for it. Now I'm going to go to my um, dialog launcher for paragraphs, where I can indent the left and the right side. Now I can see. Spin it up here, a tenth of an inch at a time. A little preview down here. And I can do the right side, only this time instead of spinning it up, I'm just going to drag across the zero. I'm going to type in 0.5, it assumes I need inches. And then once I click on OK, there it is, indented from both sides, about a half an inch. And it's easy to tell that it's indented because I've got that right side lined up nicely when I justify it. So why don't you take just a moment and do that? Click anywhere in this paragraph, books and man has always been placed, blah, blah, blah. And you can play with the justified alignment, and you can play with the indenting left and right. So the justified alignment can be done here, the left side indenting can be done up here. But if you want to control all of that stuff, maybe go to the dialog launcher, or you could notice the alignment here, left line, red line, center, justified. You could have done that here. And then I was able to indent a half an inch on each side. You can see that I've got all the line spacing right here. So take a moment and go to this dialog window. So far, I'm going to cancel. Remember to get there, you're going to go to the home tab here in the paragraph group and click on the dialog launcher. So let's increase left and right indent a half an inch. 
We'll make sure that it's uh, justified so that both left and right are lined up nicely. And while you're at it, while you're in there, why don't you do the double spacing in there as well? That could be very weird. Uh, double spacing. Right, your turn to catch up with me for that. Sometimes when I'm working on a document, I realize that the order of things that I've typed might be improved. This will let us talk about something called cut and paste, and another closely related feature called drag and drop. Well, let's go. I'm scrolling upwards, and I find this paragraph whose label says easy listening. And I'm realizing I'd like to change the order of these last two sentences. So one way to do this is through what's called cut and paste. So I'm going to select the text that I want to cut. This is my step one of my four step process. Step two, I'm going to make the cut. One way to do that right up here in the clipboard group. I'm going to hover over these scissors. As I do that, it tells me there's a keyboard shortcut for it, control and X. Or if you're a big right clicker like I am, you can right click in the selected text and make a cut there. Well, since I have this on screen right now, I'm just going to go through with that, cut that sentence. You'll see that it's gone, but it's not totally gone. It's being stored right now in an area of RAM memory called the clipboard. Hence the name of this group of buttons here, the clipboard group. And now what I want to do is paste it, but before I paste it, I have to move the flashing insertion point to the place where I want to paste it. If I paste it right now, it's going to go right back in where I took it out. So my step three of my cut and paste is to place my flash and insertion point down here in this case. And then the last step is to paste. I'm going to go here and hover over the paste button. It tells me there's a keyboard shortcut for that, control V. You know, the V in paste. Uh, yeah. I've heard of silent letters like the L in walk. The V in paste must not only be silent, apparently it's an invisible letter. The invisible V in paste, but I digress. So I'm just going to go click on that paste button, and that thing that I copied is pasted right in there. But you can go try that. Put our video on pause. Go select that sentence about you can find musical selections, blah, blah, blah. Cut it. Put the insertion point after tape of your choice, and then paste it, just like you saw me do. Maybe you'd like to right click, and you'd like to use the keyboard shortcut, but do a cut and a paste, and then come on back. To talk about another way to quickly cut and paste. This is a method called drag and drop. Sometimes people discover drag and drop totally by mistake. So next I'd like to talk about the term drag and drop. This is a quick way to cut and paste. Sometimes people will discover drag and drop totally by mistake. Let's imagine, for example, that I would like to select this line about you will find our inventory is complete, blah blah blah. Um, but I'm dragging to start selecting it, and I let go a little too early. And then I figure, oh, I'll just go start that over again. I'll grab right over here, and I'll start dragging to the right, and all of a sudden, hey, wait a minute, those words have moved around. This doesn't make sense anymore. You will find that is complete. And how much you'll spend your purchase on our inventory, you'll find that is complete. Actually, you will find that was originally right over here next to our inventory. I just accidentally discovered drag and drop. The good news is I can now point at that selected object and drag it back here. Can you see a little tick mark following me around? I'm going to drop it right here before our inventory. I have just dragged and dropped to put that back in place. Only that was by accident. Let's see how I might now do that on purpose. I want to swap the order of these last two sentences. So one way to do that, I'm going to select that whole sentence. And then instead of going through the cut and paste, I'm simply going to point in the middle of it, drag down, I see a little check mark following me, drop it right at the end of the paragraph and let go, and I have cut and pasted through drag and drop. All right, again, this is your turn. So we'll put our video on pause, rewind it if you need to, don't bother doing the mistaken one, do the right one. Select that whole sentence, let go, point in the middle of it, drag it down, and you will have swapped the order quicker than copy and paste. So I'd like you to try that. Select that text and then drag it down and that's the quickest way to cut and paste. Catch up with me. Now that's all well and good if I'm moving things around inside of a document. But what if I want to copy something from one document to another? Um, let's talk about that for a moment. This is going to be copy and paste rather than cut and paste. So. Again, the steps are going to be four square. I have to select the thing to make a copy of. 
and I have to make the copy. Then I have to place my insertion point where I want to paste, and then I do the pasting. Okay, so this time it won't disappear. I'm not cutting and pasting, I'm copying and pasting. But first, I want to have a new document. Now we've seen that if we go up to the file menu and choose new, we've got all these templates here. Well, what if I just want to make a brand new document? Well, there is a keyboard shortcut for this. It's control and the letter N as in new. And that's a pretty universal keyboard shortcut for pretty much every program you're going to see. Control N, not end. We know that control N takes me to the end of my document. Control N makes a brand new document. And that's what I'm going to do right now. Control N. So there's a brand new document. And if I want to switch back and forth between the documents that I have open, I can do that down on my taskbar, which you can't see right now, or in Word, I can go up to my View tab, and I've got a choice here about Switch Windows. And when I click on the Switch Windows button, here's my memo document is still open, here's my working large document is still open, and then here's the generic name, Document 3, because I haven't saved it yet. But this will give me a place to paste what I want to copy. So I'm going to switch windows back to my working large document. I'm going to go select maybe all of this right here, the label and that paragraph, and then I'm going to make a copy, not a cut. I don't want to disappear it out of this window. I just want to copy it. So here's the button for copying. As I hover, it tells me the keyboard shortcut for that is Control C. No invisible letters there. I'm just going to click on copy. If I was doing this in Excel, I would see a question mark here around the thing I copied. In Word, you don't really get any clue that you've copied it. You just have to trust that you've copied it. And then I'm going to switch over to that other window, the new document I just created. That was my view tab, switch windows, go into my newly created document three, and now I want to paste in there. Hmm, let's see, I don't see the paste command because I'm looking at the view tab right now. The paste command is over here under the home tab, or control V, or any of those things that we've seen, right clicking down here to paste. But I'm just going to paste that bad boy, and there it is right there. This wasn't a cut and paste, this is a copy and paste. So why don't you try that? Uh, what was my keyboard shortcut for make a brand new document? Hopefully you leave to the tip of your tongue was control and the letter M. And then to switch back and forth between the documents, we went to the view tab and switch windows. We went to working large document. We selected the thing that we wanted to copy. Then we went to our view tab and switched windows back to the new document. And repaste it. So your turn. Catch up with me there. Rewind the video if you need to, but I think you got this stuff in your head. Try it out. Catch up with me. Copying and pasting between them. What I'd like to do next is put together a list of the different types of music that are offered. But in this case, the order of them doesn't matter. We're going to talk about making two kinds of lists: a bulleted list with little dots, or a numbered list with little dots, numbers. You use a numbered list when the order of the objects is important. But in this case, this list of different types of music, the order is not particularly important, so I want to do bullets instead. But maybe I'm not quite sure how to start bullets. In the old days, I would have gone to the help window. There would be a little menu command up here that says help. Now they've replaced it with this choice, telling me what you want to do. So I'm going to click in there, and then I'm going to start typing, because what I want to do is add bullets. So I start typing the word bullets. And the more I type, the more focused it becomes. And then, in fact, here is the way to turn on bullets. I click on it, and it's actually going to do it. It's not telling me, oh, you should go to the blah, blah menu and do this. It's actually letting me do it right here. So I'm going to click on this bullets command. And there comes a bullet. And then I'm going to say, all right, one kind of music is going to be rock different kinds of rock. So when I hit the other key, it assumes that I want to continue that bulleted list. And now I want to make what's called a sub-bullet, that is, subcategories of rock. Well, one of the ways to do that is to hit the tab key. That's what I'm about to do right now. And notice how it indents and it changes the look of the bullet. So I can talk about different kinds of rock. I can talk about rock and roll. I can talk about headbanger rock. If the other key, it assumes that I want another bullet at that level, but in this case, I want to switch from rock to gospel, which means I want to make another bullet like this one. Well, a couple ways to do that. Uh, to make a sub-bullet, I hit the tab key and it indents. 
But if I want to go the other direction, if I want to up now, I hold the shift key and hit the tab key. And I'm going to do that again. And now I've got that first type and pull up so I can mention the gospel. I'm going to hit the other key as soon as I want another one at that level. So if I want to indent that and talk about other kinds of gospel, I can do that. Or I can say now I want to talk about jazz, which happens to be my personal favorite. I'm going to hit the other key and I'm going to put subcategories of jazz. I'm using the tab key to indent. So I'm going to have, uh, let's see, old school swing jazz. I'm going to have from the 50s something called bebop. And there's something called the post bop era. And then there's modern jazz. There's the soft jazz. So and if I need to indent even more, I can use tab, tab, tab. You can see there are several levels of bullets and sub bullets. So, so what if I'm done with my list? How do I tell it I don't want to do buttons anymore? Well, there's one of the ways. I can hit the enter key, and it assumes I want a bullet just like the previous level. And if I hit enter key one more time, I am no longer bulleting. So I would like I'd like you to try that. I'd like you to try what I just did. Uh, start out by using the tell me what you want to do button up here. It's, um, uh, it's always up there. And you're going to type in bullets, and as you do that, it'll find the bullets button. You can click on it then, and it'll make a bullet for you, and then you can create this list. Remember to indent to make a sub bullet, you use the tab key. To outdent to make it a you know, previous level bullet, you use shift and tab. All right, catch up. All right, I'm hitting the enter key a couple of times to stop my bulleted list. I'm going to do one more enter to leave a little gap. Now I want to talk about a closely related thing called numbered lists. If we go to our home tab, we will discover there is a button right here for bullets, and right next door there's a button for numbering. Also, I should mention that next to each of those is a sneaky little list arrow. I could choose other kinds of bullets, or I can choose what kind of numbering I want. Do I want a number with a period? Do I want a number with a parenthesis? Do I want Roman numerals? I'm going to try this way this time for my numbers. I'm going to click the little pull-down arrow, and I'm going to choose the ones with the parentheses. Here. Notice I'm getting a live preview down there as I'm doing it. I'm clicking. So here's my first step. Now I'm a part-time musician, so maybe I want to talk about the steps to recording a piece. So let's see, starting right from the beginning, I have to get out my heart. I need to put it together. And let me just see something happen there. I didn't capitalize the first letter, but as I began typing and hit the space bar, it assumed that I wanted a capital letter as the beginning of a new sentence. So put the horn together. Step three, take out the music. I want some sub numbers here. So I'm going to hit the enter key and then I'm going to use the tab key to get a sub number. In this case, it pulls up a uh, lowercase letter. So when I take out the music, I have to decide whether it will be pop or swing. That's me. Using my B there. Also, you might. Notice the red squiggle here, that's my spell checker running. I'm going to right click on that word and it offers me other words that I might have meant and I can click on, yeah, this is the one I want. I'll be spell checker there. Now when I hit the enter key, it assumes that I want another one at that level. But if I want to make this one a number four instead, what do you suppose I'm going to do? I'm going to do exactly what I did with the bullets. I'm going to shift tab. Holding the shift key, hitting tab, I'm now making a number four. So I've taken out the music. Now I want to set the music on the music stand. I want to turn on the microphone and uh, swing, baby. And I actually know musicians who kind of talk that way. Yeah, baby, let's swing. Don't worry about the club owner. Sweat not, baby. Yeah, I guess I do kind of people who talk that way. And then when I tell it that I want to stop uh, numbering, I could do that by hitting the enter key enough times to stop the numbering. All right, your turn. So you're going to go turn on the numbering. We did it up here this time. We'll pull down arrow, sneaky list arrow next to the numbering button. 
can choose one of the different ones here. If you want to go with Roman numerals or something like that, feel free to do that. And then put together some steps. They can either be the steps like I'm doing, or they could be steps to something that you do very often. So make a numbered list, everybody. The subject of discussion for this module is going to involve something called themes. So a theme is something that's available all across the office suite. It's a combination of fonts and colors and special lighting and shadow effects that you'll only see when you make diagrams. But the fonts and the colors you'll see during the regular typing. The whole idea of a theme is getting a consistent look across all of your documents in the office suite. So for example, I could have the same fonts and colors in my three panel brochures that I created in Word, same fonts and colors that I use in my PowerPoint presentations, same fonts and colors that I use in my charts and graphs in uh, Microsoft Excel, for example. So this is one of the things that works all the way across the office suite. I'd also like to introduce some of these styles up here. Under the Home tab, there's something called the Styles Gallery. So we'll be talking a little bit more about text styles in a future subject. But right now is the place where I can introduce them because they kind of tie into the themes. So first thing I'm going to do is go up here and click on the Heading 1 Style in the Style Gallery. And then down here I'm going to click to place my cursor. And then I want to talk about the Bebop era. And so I'm make that a heading one style. Notice as I hover over it, I can see the live preview. I'm going to click on that. And when I look up here in the corner, I can see that the um, theme called heading one consists of Calibri light font in 16 point size. Now when I hit the enter key, it is no longer heading one. It has switched to something called the normal style. And the normal style seems to be time to Roman 12 point font. Right, and now I'm going to type a little something about the Bebop era, but I'm not going to make you watch me type it. I'll uh, put the video on pause, I'll type the thing in, and then I'll bring it back. So there's the stuff that I've typed in, and I would like you to do the same. So we had a heading one for the Bebop era, we hit the enter key, it switched to normal font, and then maybe let me magnify this little screen a little bit to make it easier to read. I'm using some third party zooming software here. Alright, so I'll enter that text, hit the enter key one more time. And then we're going to come back and see how the themes will affect how this looks. All right, everybody. Hey, welcome back. So I'm going to zoom out with my third party software here. I'm going to leave this down near the bottom of the screen, and you'll see why in just a moment. So um, here's what I would recommend. Everybody, right now, click to put your cursor in that uh, Heading 1 style right here, the Bebop era. This will make it easier to see changes when we start changing our theme. So click and put your cursor right there in the Bebop era, and we're moving on. So I'm going up to the Design tab here in Word, and my Themes button is way over here at the left. And when I click on it, I see a list of these themes. They seem to have slightly different fonts. They seem to have different color swatches in there. But I might not really see much of anything changing right now, because the main thing that's changing is that having one style, and I can't see it. It's covered up by my list of themes. I mean, that's kind of irritating. But there is something I can do about that. I can go down here to the bottom right corner. Notice I get a two-headed arrow. And when I grab that, I can readjust this list of themes. Now, one bad thing is next time I go to get the list of themes, it will forget that I have resized it like that. So this is just a one-time little band-aid here. But it does let me expose the thing that I want to view while I'm doing my live preview. Here I am now hovering over these different themes. I can see the colors of those letters changing in that heading one style. I can see the font itself changing in the heading one style. So, so I would like you to try what you just saw me do. So, so you're clicking to put your cursor in the Bebop era title. That's very important here. Click on the pull down arrow of the themes. Grab the bottom right corner of the themes gallery. Stretch it over here and then hover over the different themes to see the live preview of how those fonts and colors would change. Your turn. Now once again, if I go up and click on the list of themes, I see that there are kind of interesting names here. I was not sure if I can zoom in on them using my third party software. Yes, I can. So I've got names like Facet and Integral and Ion. And you can see that the fonts are different and the color swatches are different. Facet, Integral, and Ion. One of the interesting things about a theme is that it's available all across the office suite. 
So I'm going to take a moment and open up Excel so that we can see the same themes with names like Fastfood and Integral and Ion will be available on the Excel side. So I'm sliding down to my taskbar. You can't really see me doing that. I'm starting up Excel. Welcome to our discussion with your Excel. We'll start a blank workbook here. And then in Excel, the themes are listed under the Page Layout Command tab. And as I click on the pull down arrow for the themes, I'll look at the names that I have available here Facet and Integral and Ion and so forth. So the themes is one of the few things that goes all across the Office Suite. And again, the idea is to give that nice branded look to your Word documents, make them look similar to your PowerPoint presentations, make them look similar to your Excel documents. And I'm going to close Excel all right now. So you've had a chance to just get a little bit of exposure to the idea of a theme here. And again, the theme is combinations of fonts and colors. And we didn't see any of the special lighting and shadow effects that only, only show up for diagrams and charts. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks for hanging out and checking out module one of our Microsoft Word 2016 lessons. This is Dan McAllister signing off of our first part, module one. Hopefully you'll come back and do module two. Welcome. Or as the case may be for some of you, welcome back to the wonderful world of Word 2016. As you can see here, my name is Dan McAllister, and I'm the presenter today, and we're about to start Module 2. Now, we realize that not everybody takes these modules in order. Maybe you looked at the subjects in Module 1 and told yourself, oh, I know how to do all of those. I'm just going to go jump into Module 2. You'll need some practice files. And I'm not going to start every single module, but here's how you get to the practice files. So if you didn't take Module 1, you might want to go back and look at just the beginning of it to see how to get the practice files that we're going to use in our lessons. So when they arrive, they will arrive in a zipped folder. I recommend you put the zipped folder out on the desktop and then extract the documents out of the zipped folder. And you'll wind up with a expanded folder that looks like this. So let me step out of here and go to my desktop for just a moment. So you will wind up with a folder out here that says Word Sample Files. And when you don't click to look in it, here are the sample files that we'll be using. And then as part of Module 1, again, let me step out of here. Uh, as part of Module 1, we also made this folder named Finished Word Documents. And if you're not quite sure how to make a folder on your desktop, here's how you can do it. I'm going to do right click here. So I'm going to right click down the desktop, and I see a choice called New, and a little submenu. I'm going to make a new folder, name the folder. And then you can begin typing whatever you want to name that. In this case, Finished Word Documents. So I'm going to delete that off my screen. Yes, I really wanted to. I'd like you to set up that much. Create that folder to drop your finished documents in, download and expand the Word Sample Files folder, and we're going to jump right in. So we'll put the video on pause and go do that much, and then I come out back and we're going to start work. All right, everybody, welcome back. Uh, you can't see my taskbar down at the bottom of my screen, but I do have a new W down there. I'm going to click on that right now to start Word 2016, and why don't you take a moment and do that as well. So as you start this program, you're going to see these templates that appear right away. There are ways to turn them off. We haven't had a chance to talk about that yet. But I don't really want to start with a blank document or a template this time. I'd like to go down here and click on Open Other Documents. So why don't you do that as well? Just pause the video for a second. Go down there and click on Open Other Documents. When you do that, it should come up looking kind of like this, only you won't have the same things on the right-hand side. So do that for a moment. Click on Open Other Documents. Okay, assuming that you've done that, let's then click down here on Browse, the Browse button. So now I'm in here looking at all the different folders that are on my hard drive. And like good Microsoft and Adobe programs, it's looking in the Documents folder first. But I just told you a moment ago to put things on your desktop. So I'm going to scroll up here and go to the desktop. Over at the right hand side, you should be able to see the word sample files like I have. I'm going to double click to open that. And then on this basically alphabetized list, I'm going to scroll down and find a document named Practice Large Document. I'm going to make the window a little bit taller so I don't have to scroll quite so long. Here I'm scrolling down and I'm looking for Practice Large Document. Once I find it, I'm double clicking on it to open it. As you open yours, you may get a warning at the top of your screen that says, you need to enable editing, and if you see that, I go ahead and click on that. 
There's just something going on on the right side of my screen that won't be happening to you. So take a moment and catch up with me. Now, again, I'm going to put the video on pause and go open practice live document, and when you come back, it's going to look like this. All right. First glance, it looks like Dan McAllister and may open a blank document. But it turns out if you scroll down, I'm rolling my scroll wheel right now, um, there is stuff on page two and page three and page four. So our first subject of module two is to talk about something called page breaks. And in this particular document, there is at least one page break in there already. In fact, there are a couple. And there's at least one place where we need a page break. Um, when I say page break, what I'm talking about is a way to force Microsoft Word to start a new fresh page with the, whatever information is sitting at your flashing cursor, also called insertion point. So there is actually a page break here on the first page, and I'd like to show it to you. So this document looks like it is a blank document, but there's actually stuff going on in the background. And I'm going to reveal that by going up and click on this little object right up here. Its name is the Pilcro, and when I click on it, I can see some information going on in the background. For example, several Pilcros. Those represent places where someone has hit the enter key when they set this up. And I've got a little thing down below there called a page break. And that's actually the subject of discussion for this first part of module two, removing page breaks, adding page breaks, and so forth. Um, so I'm going to leave the pull post turned on, and we'll scroll down a bit. You don't necessarily need to do this with me just yet. You can just watch for a moment. So scrolling down a bit, and I see that towards the bottom of page two, there is a nice new section that appears called Top 10 Favorites. And then they've got some books down here, and there's a table that starts on one page and continues on the next page, and then has a big blank section because of the page break that's right here. So we need to talk about inserting page breaks and removing page breaks and what the heck is a page break and why would I bother using them. So I'm going to turn off the full pros at the moment. And uh, you might as well scroll up and down in your document for a moment with the full pros turned on. And you would be able to see that there is a page break up there on page one. And there's a page break down here at the bottom of page three. And we're going to remove some of those and we're going to add one of those. Okay. Just a second to do that, and then turn off the full pros, and we should be ready to go. So I'll give you just a second to do that. Put the video on pause and catch up with you. All right. So I'm going to scroll down a bit more now. So this place where I've got this thing about top 10 favorites. So I would like to move that down to the next page. And what I'll see a lot of people do is they'll click maybe just above it, and start hitting the enter key to move that thing down. Now, it turns out this is not a great idea, and we'll see why. So we'll just watch my screen for a moment. I'm going to hit the enter key, and I'm moving it down. Enter, 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 until it goes to page two. Or in this case, page three, physically. And so, uh, you know, so far that seems to have cured a problem, but it can actually make a problem. Because what if I need to go up here and add some things? Um, if I add more lines, then what that'll do is kick this thing down even further. Or if I remove some lines, it will move that thing upward, and I will have kind of wasted my time hitting the enter key a bunch of times to try to line that up. So really, I'm going to take that back. Actually, I should probably show you what's wrong with it. So I'm going to go back up here to the top. I'm going to expose the bill codes, and I'm going to take out these enter keys and that page break right there. So I'll Selecting the enter keys, the pull curls, I tap the delete key, they're gone. And now I'm going to tap the delete key again to get rid of this page break. And now everything moves up to the top of that page. And as I scroll down, there's my enter, 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 enter. And it kind of looks okay down here. But if I decide, oh, I need to add some things, like, um, gosh, anything, I'll just put in my name. And when I hit the enter key, it then kicks this thing down a little bit more. And the more things I add up, at the top, the more this thing pushes down. So well, that was not the best way to do that by hitting a bunch of enter keys. Let's talk about a better way. So first thing I'm going to do is undo a bunch of those things. Um, we, we talked about undo in module one. Let me mention it here. There is an undo button right up here. And as I hover over it, it tells me there's a keyboard shortcut for it, Control-Z. So a lot of people have used the undo button 
They're basically fearless. I can just try stuff. But as I talk to people, most of them have never discovered this sneaky little list arrow just to the right of the undo button. I'm going to click on that. And what I've seen now is a list of what I did last, and what I did just before that, and just before that, and just before that. In this case, what I would like to do is undo all of those. Now I can either use Control Z, Control Z, Control Z, or click the undo, 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 or I can just roll down here. Um, notice these are in reverse order. So as I go down to the lowest one on the list, this will be the earliest one that I did. By the way, there's no way to undo that seventh one without undoing the six things that I did since then. But this is a really nice way to take back all the stuff I've done so far. As I click on that thing right there, and now I've got all those cocos at the beginning of page one. And here's my table that starts on a funny looking page and doesn't continue um, nicely on the rest of the page. So we're now going to do this next thing together. Actually, you'll still watch me do it, and then um, I'll continue with you. So I'm going to go in right now and select those cocos. And I'm going to tap either the delete or backspace key. And then with my cursor flashing right here at the left end of the page break, I'm tapping the delete key again. And now i got my books and beyond title is right at the top of page one. And I'd like to do that. So put the video on pause, turn on the cocos, go select the cocos on page one and delete them. And then with the cursor at the beginning of the line that says page break, tap the delete key one more time and it should come up looking like this. So give me just a second. Put the video on pause, go do that, then come on back and we'll do some stuff together. Alright, let's turn off the two crows. There's a little trade off there. It clutters up your screen when you've got them on screen like that. It's time to scroll down here and um, we'll start dealing with this top 10 favorites. Then I would like to move down to the next page. What I'm about to do now is I'm going to click above that, but I'm not going to hit enter, 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 enter. I'm going to insert what's called a page break. Now, you saw a moment ago what it looks like when you have the filters turned on. It looks like a little line going across there with the words page break. So I'm going to insert that right now. Um, to insert a page break, you can, for example, go up here and click on the insert command tab. And then right over here at the left-hand side, you can see a pull-down list called pages. And when I click on that, one of my choices is insert a page break right there. So I'm about to click on that. Again, I went to the insert tab, I clicked the pull down arrow under the pages command, and now I'm clicking to insert a page break. And it's going to happen right here where my cursor is. You can't see it once I go to the menu. So inserting a page break. And there, that took my top 10 favorites down to the next page. So it's your turn to do that. By the way, if we go back up here and turn on the click rows, that was under the home tab and the click rows, you can see my page break appears right there. So it's your turn. You've got the books and beyond is up at the top of page one because you removed the page break that was before it. Now scroll on down there and click just above the line that says top ten favorites and insert tab, insert pages, page break, and yours will look just as cool as mine will. Put me on pause and insert that page break. Right. Let us scroll down a little bit more. There's an awful lot of white space here below this table. And that's because just below the table, there is a page break. And in fact, if I hover over the place where it is, and I give you this little marker here, kind of hard to tell what's going on there, how could I show myself that there's actually a page break there? Yes, so I can turn on the book rows. So your job, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to get rid of the page break that's there. In order to see where it is, turn on the book rows, Click to put your flashing insertion point, also called the cursor, right at the beginning of the line that says page break, and remove it by tapping the delete key. I'll catch up with you in a moment. All right, time for me to catch up with you. Let me go to that home tab. I'm turning on the book rows. Oh, yeah, there's a page break right there. I'm going to click to put my cursor right at the beginning of that page break, and then I'm tapping the delete key. Page break is gone. The stuff that was starting on a new page has now moved up and is taking over all that white space that had been there. Although now, now, I've got a table down here kind of sitting here by itself. I've got the description of it up here. I've got the table down there, and then it continues. So some people don't mind the look of that, but other people kind of bug them. They've got a description of this table, and then the table appears. 
So we got one more thing you need to do. Let's put in a page rank right there, right above music inventory database, please. You do that and then I'll do it. Put the video on pause, go do that, and then I'll catch up with you. Time for me to catch up. I'm inserting. I'm inserting something under the pages. I'm inserting a page rank. There we go. So now we've got the description of the table on the same page as the table. And everything finishes before the end of page three. All right, very good, everybody. I'm hoping your screen looks like mine. Let's turn off the photos. I have to use the save as command to make a copy of this document, only changing its name, so that maybe later on during one of the later modules, we can come back and reopen the document name, crack this large document, and it will be exactly as it was when we first saw it. So please don't click the save button. That would destroy the original practice large document. We're going to use the save as command instead. One of the ways to get to the save as command is go to the file tab, walk into the backstage view, and then click save as. If you happen to be with us in module one, I don't think I had you use it, but I did mention a keyboard shortcut for save as is the F12 function key, which I'm about to tap right now. This is me tapping the F12 key. And oh, look, I'm in the save as window. So I want to put it in that folder named Finished Documents that's out on my desktop. Uh, I can go over here and click on Desktop. And then over here on the right-hand side, Finished Word Documents. But in Module 1, I made a little shortcut to the Finished Word Documents by grabbing that folder named Finished Word Documents and dragging it over here into the Favorites area. Now you notice it doesn't necessarily alphabetize it in there, but there it is. And the advantage of that is, in this case, it's just one click quicker. But the reason that I wanted to introduce that in these lessons is that pretty much everybody I talk to in the business world, they're working on their network and they have some shared drive. It's the H drive, it's the S drive, or whatever letter it's assigned to. And they spend a certain amount of their time going into that shared drive, into some folder, into some subfolder inside the folder that's on the shared drive that lives in the house that Jack built. Um, you could save a whole bunch of that navigating by making a little shortcut to that folder. Um, you just have to do what I did. Get to a place where you can see the folder on the H drive inside the other folder and simply drag it over here to the left. Now be careful not to drop it on a folder over there, otherwise you're basically recreating the problem, putting a folder in a folder. So you have to be careful to drop it between the folders and get one of these horizontal lines. I'm not going to drop it there right now because I already did that. I already have one, but I would suggest that you do that. And then the next time you need to save something in that folder, you don't have to stop at the desktop. You can go right to that little shortcut in the favorites. In the meantime, let's go to the finished Word documents folder. And I'd like to rename this. Instead of practice large document, I'd like to name it module two large document. So I'm dragging across the word practice. I'm retyping right over top of that. Module two um, large document. I'm going to hit the enter key or click save. And so this thing says, hey, this is going to update to the newest file format. The reason it's saying that is the original document was created in Word 2003, which actually stores its uh, documents in a different programming language than we use since 2007 version. Um, so the version that was used in 2007 is the same file language that's used now in 2010 and 2013 and going to be 2016. So it's just telling me that I'm going to be upgraded to the newest file format. Free upgrade. And I'm going to hit the enter key or click OK. And I should be able to see the new name up there in module to large documents. You may or may not see the four letter file name extension up there. Don't worry if you don't. Um, but you shouldn't see the words compatibility mode up there when you do. So go do what I did. Do not click the save button. Instead, go to file and save as. Or what was my keyboard shortcut for save as? Those of you who just chimed in, F12, extra 10 points for you. I don't know where you're going to trade in those points for any prizes, but file them away somehow. All right, so that's your job. You save as, uh, name it module 2, our document, and put it in our finished Word documents folder. Next subject of discussion concerns the white space around the edges of the pages. Now, if I look up at the ruler at the top here, I can see roughly an inch and a quarter on the left side, another inch and a quarter on the right side. And it's a little bit tough to tell what's happening at the top and the bottom of the page. I 
back in the page, I should also be able to see the ruler at the side. Um, so by the gray space on the ruler, it looks like I got an inch of margin at the top, an inch of margin at the bottom of the page. So an inch and a quarter left and right, inch top and bottom. Maybe I would like to change that. Maybe, for example, I have one of those cool printers that will print on both sides of the paper, and I would like to leave a little bit of extra space to put in staples or three ring binder holes or something like that on the inside of each page. And then as I print on the back side of the page, I still want the three ring binder holders on the inside of the page. And what that means is it's on the left side of the front of the page and the right side of the back of the page. And I shouldn't still be excited all these years later about having a printer that prints both sides of the page, but I do not mind. I do a lot of printing and not having to print one side of the page all the time or put in half the pages and flip them over and print the other half, what I used to have to do, and I'm a happy camper now with a true side of the printer. So let's talk about setting up the white space, the margins, for a two sided printer here for a moment. So to get to the margins, I'm going to go up to the Layout command tab to bring the layout ribbon, and then over here at the left hand side is a button about margins. So let's talk about the white space at the side and top and bottom of the page. Now, why do they do that? Why do they bother putting white space around the edges? Well, it turns out that if you have really long lines that go very near the edges of the page, it's easier for your eyes to get lost reading across those longer lines. And hardly anybody has a printer that will print right to the edge of the page anyway. So you're going to have some white space in there somehow. You might as well learn to control what that does. So I'm going to go up here and uh, click the pull-down arrow for the margins. And you will see that there are several presets. So we've got the half inch at the top, bottom, and left and right. We have something called moderate. We have something called wide. Uh, mirrored, we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, you'll notice one of them has kind of a blue box down here. Uh, it is the 2003 default, and you may remember that when we saw that thing about updating the file format, I had mentioned that this did come from a 2003 file, so that's why it has an inch at the top and the bottom and an uh, inch and a quarter on left and right. But if I want to change those, then I just need to go a little bit farther down here. So there's a scrollable list up here, and then down at the bottom there's one that says custom margins. I'm going to click on that. And that opens up this dialog window. You can see its title says page setup. And among other things, it's got information about the margins, top, bottom, left, and right, and etc. So why don't you join me in that window for just a moment? That is, uh, put the video on pause. And to be able to see that layout window for the margins, you're going to want to click on the layout command tab, which produces the layout ribbon. And then over here at the left side, click the pull down arrow for the margins. And then click on custom margins and your screen should look like mine. So put the video on pause for just a moment and catch up with me into the page setup window to talk about margins. So you can see there aren't just four boxes here, top, bottom, left, and right. There's also something called gutter and gutter position. Very often the gutter is used to temporarily increase margins for maybe three ring binders. Or you can just increase the left margin for those things, as long as you're used to be printing on one side of the page. But if you're going to be printing on both sides of the page, it's going to take a little trick. It won't be called the left side, and you'll see that here in a moment. So um, I'm noticing down here towards the bottom of this window, there's a little list box that says apply to whole document. Uh, right now, that's what I want to do, apply to a whole document with whatever I set up. Then I've also got a thing here that says multiple pages. And as I click on that pull down arrow, I can say, well, I'm going to print two pages on each sheet and then fold it like a booklet. In fact, there's a slightly different thing called book fold. And then I'd like to introduce this idea of mirrored margins. Now, right now it says you got a left margin and a right margin. Watch what happens if I say mirrored margins. Here I see a little sample of two pages where I'm going to be printing on both sides of the page. And now you notice it doesn't say left and right, it says inside and outside. So if, for example, I set these up to be an inch on the top and the bottom, and the inside and the outside, then this is a little sample of what it's going to look like. The white space on the inside and outside edges are the same. Now, what about my three ring binder? Well, I could add a gutter here. And put the gutter, notice it says left, it doesn't really say inside. 
Or the way I'll usually do it is I'll just increase the inside margin a little bit. So I'm going to change my inside margin from one inch. I'm going to click and I'm going to make it maybe 1.25 inches on the inside. And then if I click on some other box, it's kind of subtle. But notice now the inside margin in the sample box is ever so slightly wider than the outside margin in the sample box here. So um, the front page would be on this side. This would be page one, and then a page two and three, four and five. So my even numbered pages would be on the left. My odd numbered pages would be on the right. My cover page would be one of the right right side pages. So that's the idea of mirrored margins. And so maybe I want to make the top margin a little bigger or a little smaller. This is a box where you can do that. Bottom margin as well. All I've done is increase the inside margin and changed it to mirrored margins. I didn't even know the direction there. Actually, I did the mirror margins first. So instead of saying left and right, it now says inside and outside. And change that inside margin to an inch and a quarter. And when you click on OK, you will see as you scroll up and down here, here's my odd number page. And then my even number page, if I can zoom out a little bit here, you can see they are not starting at the same indentation. That's because my odd number pages have the inch and a quarter, my even number pages have the inch margin. So they should see that in action right now. So if I could put the video on pause and go catch up with me. Again, I went to the margins pull down arrow, went to custom margins, change them from normal to mirrored margins, and increase the inside margin to an inch and a quarter, please. Right. Let's take just a moment and save that document that we've been working on. I don't need to change its name again. I want to keep it named Module 2 Large Document. And a quick way to do that is to just go up and click on this little icon right here. And years ago in a class, this was quite a few years ago now, I had a lady ask me in the middle of the class, What's that little TV set up in the corner? I had no idea what she was talking about. I went and looked over her shoulder and she was pointing at this thing. This little floppy disk icon here. I'm not sure how many of you are willing to admit that you saw floppy disk somewhere in your computer studies. Some of you may even have seen the wobbly floppy floppy disks along the way. I have to cut myself in that class and I'm feeling really old and depressed. So I'm moving on. Let's go up and click on that. Little TV set. That's actually what we just called it the rest of the semester. Everybody go up and click the little TV set. Make sure you save the latest and greatest version of your document. Everybody knew what I was talking about then. So I'm going to go click the little TV set. It doesn't ask me what to name it or where to put it. It just updates it. All right, our next subject of discussion, I would like to use a separate practice file here. So let us go to File and Open. Or those of you who like keyboard shortcuts, Keyboard shortcut for opening a file is Control and the letter O. So I'm actually going to do that right now. I'm going to hold Control and tap the letter O, not the number zero, the letter O. And here I am now opening a file. So if you'd like to try that, Control and O to get yourself where I am. Put the video on pause and do that for just a second. Right now, we're going to slide down and click on the Browse button. So remembers that the last place I've been working was the finished Word documents folder. What I need is the Word work files folder. So I'm going to scroll up just a little bit over here on the left side and go to my Word sample files folder. And then scroll down and find a document named Section Breaks for Module 2. And maybe that quick double click. Comes up on your screen, you may see a thing about needing to enable editing. If you do see that, you're going to click on enable editing. And then your screen should pop up looking like this. I'm going to zoom in a little bit by holding the control key and rolling my scroll wheel on my mouse. All right, so put the video on pause, take just a second and catch up to me. Open the file named section breaks, please, and then come on back. So, so maybe I'd like to take part of my document and make it look like two columns wide. Uh, if I can just scroll down a little bit and click somewhere in the document and go start looking for columns, I'll find something about columns under the Layout tab here. So I'm going to go click on that Layout tab. And then you should notice that there is a button over here about columns. And when I click on the pull-down arrow under columns, I get to choose how many columns. 
Now by default, the columns are going to be equally spaced with just a little bit of white space between them, a little margin gutter they call it. I can offset them so that I have a skinnier column on the left, or a skinnier column on the right, or three columns. If I went down here to more columns, I can actually choose how many columns I want. But when I started this discussion, I said I wanted two columns. I'm about to make a little mistake here. All I'm going to do is click on two columns. All right, there's quite a little mistake. All of a sudden, it looks like a newspaper. You know, sometimes referred to as newspaper style columns. And if that's what I wanted, okay, that's great. But things can get a little bit strange there because I've got to read all the way to the bottom of that first column and then move my eyeballs up and read all the way to the bottom of that second column and then I'm going to the next page. That's fine if that's what I'm trying to do, but in my case, that's not what I was trying to do. I only wanted to make part of the document appear as two columns. Oh, thank goodness for undo. I'm going to go up here and click on the undo button or I can use control Z. And there I'm back to one column. Oh, that's better. So you don't actually have to go do that. You saw what was bad about it. As you can imagine, maybe what I should have done first is select the text that I wanted to put in the two columns. So I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to do that. I see a thing here that says to change the overall look of your document. And then the next paragraph is about when you create pictures, charts, or diagrams. So I'm going to put those as two columns side by side instead of two paragraphs above and below each other, which is what's going on right now. So first thing I'm going to do is select what text I want to put into two columns. And then I'm going to go up and click on my columns button. And I'm going to make two columns. And notice it only affects that much of my text. So I'd like you to do what you just saw me do. Scroll down to the part that says, let me undo that. Scroll down to the part that says, to change the overall look of your document. Looks like that's about the one, two, third fourth big paragraph, and select that paragraph and the one next to it, and then you go up here to your layout tab, click on the pull down arrow, and make it two columns, and notice it only affects that much of your text. So, pause the video, go do that. I'd like to show you behind the curtain here, go turn on the full crows, you're going to watch me do it first, go into the home tab, turn on the full crows, oh look, there's a section break right there, and a section break right there. A section break is different than a page break. Think of your document as a big uh, building, and by putting in section breaks, you put in some interior walls. So that's what we just did, and that happened here in the background because of the way that Word is set up. When you select text and put it into columns, it puts a section break above and a section break below. I just adjusted my screen a little bit so that you can see my status bar down here. Right now, as part of my status bar, it tells me what section that I'm in, what page I'm working on, how many total pages I have, how many words are in here. And sometimes when you first look down here in the status bar, you might not see the section number, and that's something that can be turned on and off by right-clicking in this area called the status bar. So I'm pointing at the status bar, I'm clicking my right mouse button, and I get a pop-up list of things that I would be able to see down in my status bar if I check mark them. So if you don't see one for the section down here, then check mark the one called section. And then you could tap the escape key to step out of that list and you should be able to see what section you're in. So take just a moment and do that. Put the video on pause, go down and right click on the status bar and turn on the section um, indicator as well. All right, good work. So now we can see what section we're in. When I click above that section break, it says I'm in section one. When I click in the two paragraphs, it says I'm in section two. And when I click below those two paragraphs after that section break, it says I am now in section three. So we should be able to check that out. Take just a second and do that. Check out section one, section two, section three. We just saw how to do it. Not so crazy about what's happening right down at the bottom of my first column. And it's a little bit tough to tell where that column ends and the next one begins. I can tell easily because I see the full crows. But what I'd like to do is take that next paragraph, I'm going to click just to put my flashing insertion point there, hit the enter key, and give me just a little bit of a line, um, a little bit of space in there. So I'd recommend that you do that. So click just at the beginning of the following paragraph, tap the enter key, take that thing down, puts in another full crow, 
So as you begin to scroll down, it's looking fairly nice here. I do have a paragraph that starts on one page and finishes on another. But the longer document I'm working on, the more often that happens. I'm not going to worry too much about that. So, so, so far, the um, section breaks that we put in were just for a small piece of text, not a whole page. But sometimes I do want to insert not only a page break, but a section break to lead to something that we're eventually going to talk about when we get to um, mentioning headers and footers. Not headings. Headings are, uh, are font styles. Headers is something else, and we're going to be talking about that pretty darn soon here. So I would like to get to the top of my document. There is a nice keyboard shortcut to do that. Maybe you know it already. Or maybe you saw us use it in module one. Think about what it is. Wait for it. Yeah, it's control and home. If you're not familiar with this, if I click in the middle of the line and I just tap the home key on the right side of my keyboard, it moves my cursor to the beginning of that line. But if I want to get to the whole beginning of the entire document, I can hold control and tap the home key, which is what I'm about to do right now. And what I would like you to do is hold control and tap the home key. Now you can see a label up here that says chapter one. Oh, here. Why don't we do a little bit of work with those margins? So I'm heading up to the layout tab. I'll click on the margins pull down now. And I'm here to custom margins. So we'll leave the top and the bottom at one inch. Let's change it from normal pages to mirrored margins. We're going to say uh, top and bottom is one inch. Inside, it doesn't say left anymore, it says inside. We're going to make that an inch and a quarter. A little extra room there for our binders, three ring binders, spiral binders. But on the outside, let's make it three quarters of an inch. That is 0.75 of an inch on the outside. And then let's at the bottom here, it says this would apply to only this section. Now we've actually got more than one section here because of the columns that we did. So let's say apply to the entire document. Choosing OK. I can see the extra space at the left side of one page and then at the right side of the next page and so forth. We'll take just a moment and do that if you want. Know, margins, custom margins. Start out with mirrored margins, inch and a quarter on the inside, three quarters of an inch on the outside. And don't apply it just to this section. Make sure you apply it to the entire document. I'm using control in the scroll wheel to zoom out until I can see more than one page here. I'm going to zoom to uh, what we might call two up. And notice that right now it looks like the inside margin is the skinny one and the outsides are the um, wider one. Let me just talk about how this thing is actually going to print. So uh, I'm going to go to a PowerPoint slide here. I have a little picture of the word icon. Now, um, this is supposed to simulate a document, so here's the front page. This would be page one here. And then as we flip this thing open, this would be my page two. And then this one is going to be my page three. So what we were seeing on the screen a moment ago when we had it zoomed out isn't quite what's going to be happening. And maybe a way to see that, let's go back to my word document here. Zoom out just a little bit more so that I can see through them. So here's going to be the opening page, and then here is the inside page. So this, this way you can see that right in here we're going to have the wider margins when we put in our binder on the inside of those pages two and three. I'm going to zoom in. Again, I'm just using control and scroll to be able to do that. So if I show the pull crows, let me make sure I do, that when we set up these columns, we automatically put in what's called a continuous section break at the beginning of the two columns, and another section break continuous at the bottom of that. So those appear just automatically, and uh, this is bugging me a little bit. I'm going to take that here and tap the inner key to move that pattern just a little bit. Um, you can do that if you want. It's not terribly important. What I'd like to do now is break this document down into its multiple chapters by turning each chapter into a section. So here we have a section that's less than one page. What we're about to create are some sections that are more than one page. Uh, I'm going to turn off the pull crows just because they're not terribly important for this part. 
So I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to find where it says chapter two. There it is. Chapter two pictures. I'm going to click to put my cursor right there. And then I would like to insert a special kind of section break. This is going to start a new section and it's going to start a new page. We've seen how to insert a page break. We're always to do that once you're under insert and pages and page break. Or as I cover it, it says control and return, control and the enter key. That would create a new page, but it wouldn't create a new section. So for this, we're going to switch instead to the layout tab, and then you'll see a choice in here about the breaks. And when I click on that, you'll notice the breaks are broken down into two parts here, page breaks versus section breaks. And there's actually one of them that's both. This guy right here, next page, says insert a section break and start a new section on the next page. So that's what I'm going to do right here. Next page break. Boom, well, there it is, starting a next page. And if I turn on the pull pros again, pull tab, pull pros, I can see it's not just a page break, it is a section break called next page. So that's your job right now. Put our video on pause, scroll down and find that spot where it says chapter two, click to put your insertion part right there, go to the layout tab, insert a break that is a next page break. That'll start a new section and a new page. Put our video on pause, go join it. Right, this to do is find where it says chapter three. Now I can scroll down and eyeball it, but there is actually a find command that's available here. So I'm going to go up to the home tab. Over here I've got a choice to find something. When I click on that it opens up my left side navigation pane and then I can tell it what I'm looking for. I would like to look for the specific words chapter three. That's where chapter three is. And now that I've found it, I can close the little searching window, click there, I'm going to insert one more of them. Let's see, where is that? What tab is it under? That was under layout. We're going for breaks. And next page break. Insert. Your job is to do that now. You're going to do the find fan, find chapter three, insert one of those next page breaks. Then you're going to go find chapter four, do the same thing. Chapter five, do the same thing. When we come back, I will have that done already, and so will you. If there's a minute, I'm going to put it on pause here. So put it on pause, go find three, four, and five, and make them new next page breaks. The next thing we're going to talk about is doing stuff up here in the top margin called adding page headers. So that will be the subject of our next lesson. In our last session, we set up the margins, mirrored margins, and we inserted some next page breaks, so we have several different sections. Right now, as I look down at the bottom of my screen, I can say that I am now in section number seven. So what I want to talk about next is this header area right up here. Anything you put in the header area will appear on all of the pages at first, although we can adjust that so that I can have a different header in the different sections, and that's what we're going for for the next 15 minutes or so. Here we go. So in order to insert the header, we would go to the insert tab right up here. Let's run that up. Click on the insert tab. And one of my choices here is to insert a header. And when I click on the little pull down arrow, here comes a list of headers that are pre-created and built into every copy of Word. And I see one here called banded. And when I click on that, here is something called the banded header. And as I scroll up and down, you'll see that that's happening on every single page. And if I look closely, it's got a little place where I can click and type in the document title, and that way that would appear on every single page of every single section. But maybe I would like to have different things in each of those sections. Maybe at the top of all the pages in Chapter 1, I want it to say Chapter 1. At the top of every page that's in Chapter 2, I want it to say Chapter 2. So that's what we're going to do. One of the ways I can get rid of this one would be to go up here to the um, header tools, by the way, notice I am now in a whole ribbon of stuff I can do in the header. I'm going to click on header. And then down at the bottom, there's a choice about remove header. On the other hand, if I know what I want to put there instead of what's here, I don't actually have to remove it before I choose the other thing that I want to have happen there. So watch my screen. Here's the other thing I want to have happen there. Uh, so I'm going to go up here to header again. a choice that says blank. Now it turns out that's different than remove header. So I'm going to click on blank and you'll see what that does is give me a little placeholder 
where I can type stuff. And again, right now, that's happening on every single page. And whatever I type there would happen on every dang page. So I'm going to scroll way up to the top here. I could use Control Home, of course. But I'm going to click where it says Type Here. Now, right now, you can see it says Chapter 1, the Insert tab. And as I scroll down the next page, that one doesn't say anything about Chapter 1. If I put Chapter 1 up here in the header, then it will say that so far on every single page. And then we'll talk about how can I change it between the different sections. So that's where I'm headed right now. I'm going to double click down here in the text to step temporarily out of the header section. I'm going to go select that Chapter 1, the Insert tab, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to cut it. So one of the ways to do that, I can right click on it, and I'm going to cut it. And then I'm going to go click where it says Type Here. In fact, I have to double click. And that's where I'm going to paste what I just copied. And I'm going to say, all right, paste that in here. And there it is. Now, uh, I've got a couple of extra error keys down here. I'm going to just hit the delete key to get rid of one of them, leave a little bit of space. But now as I scroll down, you'll notice every single page says chapter one. Even the pages that are actually chapter two stuff. Here's chapter two pictures down here, and it says chapter one up there in the header. We're going to take care of that right now. But before we do that, I would like you, you can skip the part where we inserted the one called Banded, and just go up here and click in the header, and then um, click on the header and make it a blank one. That will give you the typing section. And then you're going to do what I did. We double clicked in the document to step out of the header. We selected the words chapter one, the insert tab. We cut them. We double clicked on the little placeholder up here, and we pasted them. So join me with that part, and then we're going to talk about how can I make the sections have different headers and footers from each other. So join me in that part thus far. Now comes the part where we have different headers for each section. So I'm going to scroll down, and I'm going to go find that area where it says Chapter 2. Yes, I can do a find for that. So here's my Chapter 2 part. Notice right now up here it says Chapter 1. This is the thing we want to take care of right now. And there's one specific, very important step in here, and I'll stress it when we get there. So I'm going to select Chapter 2 Pictures. I'm going to cut it. Right now I'm using Control X. And then I'm going to go up and click in the header part. I probably have to double click to get into the header part. And before I do any pasting, there's something really important to talk about. Notice right over here on the side, it says that this header is the same as the previous header. I don't want that to be true. I want this header to be different from the previous header. And in order to change that, we go right up here where it says link to previous, and we're going to click to turn that off. This is a really important part here. Another thing to think about, do this from top of the document to the bottom of the document. makes it way easier. If you try to work from the bottom to the top, things get really wonky. All right, so I'm going to click on link to previous to tell it I don't want it linked to previous. Notice the little marker that says same as previous is different. And now I'm going to drag across the chapter one stuff, and I'm going to paste in the chapter two stuff. And if I've done that right, if I've been very careful not to link to previous, I should be able to scroll up here and see chapter one in the section above there, and chapter two in the section below there. And right now it says chapter two on every page till the end. We'll do something about that in a moment. So I need you to catch up with me. Again, just to reiterate what I'm doing. I scrolled down, I selected the words Chapter 2 Pictures, I cut them. I went up into the header section, I double-clicked on the placeholder, but before I typed anything, I made sure to go over here and notice that it said same as previous, and the way that we got around that was, we went up here to the top and we unselected Link to Previous. Then we pasted in the Chapter 2, and then you should be able to scroll up and see Chapter 1 above and Chapter 2 below, and things would be really cool at that point. So put that video on pause. Catch up to me. Now this would be a really good time to go up and save the document. Put that little TV set. I'm going to you through one more of those, and then you're going to have to do it a couple more times after that. So just to reiterate while we're doing it, I'd like to use the Find command. You go to my Home tab and click on Find. By the way, as I hover over find, I know that you'll be able to read. Yeah, if I zoom in, you won't be able to see it. Uh, control and F is a keyboard shortcut for find. So I'm going to do that right now. Control F. 
opens up my navigation pane, and this time I want to have it find um, chapter three. In fact, um, it's in there from a similar search that I did before. And here I am now at the part about chapter three themes. So that's the thing that I'm eventually going to copy and paste up here, where it currently says chapter two all the way to the end of the document. All right, so see if you can remember the steps. We need to cut. But before we paste, we have to make sure we are not linking to previous. So maybe you can do that right now. Maybe you can remember how to do the steps, but I recommend watching one more time. So I'm selecting the text, I'm cutting it through Control X, for example. I'm going to go up and double click in the header on the area that I want to paste. But before I paste, I notice it says same as previous. That's my enemy right now. I need to not link to previous, select this text, and then paste. I'm using Control V. So now if I scroll down, I should see chapter 3 is all the way to the end. And as I move up, I ought to be able to see chapter 2 is up here. And chapter 1 is way up here. Chapter 1. Okay, so that is your job right now. You're going to do that for chapter 3. And then I'm not going to come back and show you how to do it again. You have to go find chapter 4 and do that. Chapter 5 and do that. Remember, 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 the most important part of that is not to link to previous. So you're, you're going to go do that for chapters 3, 4, and 5 now. Morning, Trick, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to pull a rabbit out of my sleeve. Uh, no, that's not what I'm going to do. What I want to talk about now is footers. So for our headers, I want a different thing at the top of each of my different chapters. For my footer, what I want it to show is in the middle of the footer, I want to see the dates, and at the right side of the footer, I'd like to see the page numbers. And I want that to happen just all the way through the document. I would not, I'm not going to have to worry about the same as previous. Although I could, there are times when people would like to have each chapter start over with page one. And in my case, I am not worried about that. So we're going to work in the footer section, and we're going to see how we could create a footer that we could use over and over again in more than one document. So I can start in any footer down here. It doesn't matter what page I'm on, doesn't matter what section I'm on, as long as I'm going to use same as previous. Um, maybe just to sort of make sense here, I'm going to go to the top of the document. I don't have to, but I'm going to. So I'm double clicking out of the footer. I'm going to use my control home keyboard shortcut to get up to the top of that pin, where it nicely says chapter one. I'm big on that. Now I'd like to insert a footer. And when I say insert a footer, I'm going to be clue. It's under the insert tab, the same way the header was. So I'm clicking on insert. I'm going to go over here to insert a footer. And in this case, I would like to have three placeholders down here. So instead of blank, I'm going to go with blank three columns. And it drops that down in my footer, three separate placeholders. Now I either have to type something in there or remove them. Otherwise, I will actually see the words type here, and that would be an awful thing. So for the first little placeholder, I'm going to click and tap the delete key. And then I'm going to go to the second little placeholder and click. And now I've got a whole ribbon up here of stuff I can do in my header and footer, like insert the date and time. So I'm going to click on that right now, inserting the date and time. It says, how would you like the date and time to look? I'm going to go with the little sharp date here. And notice a checkbox that says update automatically. So that means every time I open this document, it will show that day's date down there at the bottom. And that can be handy if I occasionally come and update this file, and when I print it out, it'll have the date of the printout. And that way, maybe I can look at two different printouts and figure out which one was the most recent, which one had the latest changes in it. On the other hand, if I would like it to show the date at which I last edited it, and not have it updated automatically every time I open it, then I would uncheck that. But in my case, I would like it to update automatically so that every time I open the document, it shows that day's date in it. So I will leave that check mark and I'll choose OK. So there is today's date. And then the other thing I said I want to put in there was the page number. So I'm going to click where it says type here over at the right hand side. And I've got a thing up here about page numbers. Now, when I click on that, I've got all kinds of choices, top of the page, bottom of the page, page margins, blah, blah, blah. I have, through my experience, discovered the best way to do that is select the place where you want the page number to be, and then go with this bad boy right here, current position. 
that my mother had any surprises about having the piercing replaced that I wasn't quite sure of. So, hovering over her current position, I see a little pull-down list of the page numbers, where I can have it just the page number, or the word page and the page number. I scroll down just a little bit. There's one of them down here. By the way, there's only one of them here that shows page X and Y. So that'll show me what page I'm on and the total number of pages, and that's the one I like. I'm going to click on that and drop it right in there. So it says, I'm looking at page one of a total of 15 pages. And if I scroll down, it says that on every single page. By the way, just a little keyboard shortcut. If I'm in the header or footer section and I tap the down arrow key, it goes to the next header or footer section. Down arrow again goes to the next header or footer section. So this way, I can see it's going to have today's date and the page number on every single page, and it's just fine with me if it's the same as previous. So now it's your turn. Just remind you what we did. First, we didn't have a header or footer. Well, we had a header, but we didn't have a footer. So in this case, we wanted to insert. We wanted to insert a footer this time. We chose the blank three columns. Then we deleted the leftmost placeholder. We put today's date in the center placeholder. And we put the page X of Y in the right side placeholder. Your turn to do that. Remind me. In our previous lesson, we just saw how to insert the footer. And I promised that we would have a way to save that for future use. Let's find out how to do that. So um, when I'm in a footer, well, let me just get there, double click in the footer area. Now I'm in the header and footer design ribbon. I click on the pull down arrow for footer. You notice there is a choice down here about save selection to the footer gallery. Also notice that it's grayed out. The queries as to why save selection to footer gallery would be grayed out. That's usually what you mean when something's grayed out on the menu. It means it's unavailable, but it also usually means that if I did something else first, then that would become available. Save selection to the footer gallery. I have not made a selection. That's why it's grayed out. So I'm going to go make a selection. I'm going to double click in the footer section. And maybe I'll move on here to the left margin so I get my up pointing right arrow. A single click selects that whole line. Now that I have a selection, I can go to the footer pull down arrow and I can say, oh, look, save selection to footer gallery. This lovely dialog window. So, so it says for the name, it's just going to put in the things that I've typed in there. And that's going to look kind of weird as the name of a footer. So I'm going to replace that name with the, uh, let's see, what's in it? Uh, date and page number. That would be the name of my personal footer that I've created. And it's got a category here called general. And you wouldn't know it now because you just have never seen it. My experience tells me if I leave that as the category called general, then my saved uh, footer is going to be down at the bottom of the list of footers that are available. So I have discovered through a little bit of practice that if I switch that from general to something called built-in, yes, I understand it wasn't really just built-in, but we're going to make that choice built-in. Then i got one more secret. And if I choose built-in, it'll put it in a group of choices near the top of the list of footers. And then i got one more secret here. If I go up and click at the beginning of the name and start it with a space bar, automatically spaces come before A's and B's and C's. So because of the built-in, it'll be in the group at the top of the list. And because of the space bar, well, it'll be almost at the very top of the list. The only two that will be above it were the ones called blank and blank three columns. So again, I'm reiterating here. I selected the text. I went to footer. I chose save selection to footer gallery. Open up this dialog window. We're naming it space bar, date, and page number. I'm going to put the category as built-in. And then I'm clicking on OK. So why did I cheat? Well, the next time I need to insert a footer, I go up here to footer, there's one. Date and page number. The only two above it are the blank and the blank three columns. Everything else that used to be down there is still below there, but mine is near the top. So it's your turn to do that. You select it, turn it into a footer, do the naming thing where you start with a space, and put it in the built-in category. Your turn to do that. I hope you're having some geeky fun along the way by now. The next subject on our agenda is to put a nice cover page on this report. 
And there are some really nice pre-created cover pages that are available. And you don't have to be sitting on page one to see this happen, but I usually like to. So I'm going to double click out of the footer section so that I'm talking in the in the main text area now. And I'm going to use my old friend by now, Control Home, to go to the top of that document. So here's what my first page looks like right now. And what I would like to do now is insert one of the pre-created cover pages. And again, insert the cover page. That means it's found under the insert ribbon here. So I'm going to go up and click on the insert tab. And then on the insert ribbon, there's a choice over here about pages. And when I click on the little pull down after that, I can see cover page, blank page, and my old friend page break. So this time I've gone with cover page. There are several that are available right out of the box. You may remember there was a header called banded. Now there's actually a cover page called banded. I'll this one out just a little bit. I kind of like this one that says filigree. I used to work at a jewelry store. A filigree ring has little cutouts in it, in the band itself, so you can see through the ring to your finger. And they'll have all kinds of decorations and stuff on, like that on a filigree ring. So I'm going to choose the filigree cover page. There it is. It drops it right in there. Now it always puts that at the beginning of the document, no matter what page I was sitting on when I did it. And you can't have more than one cover page. Well, actually you can if you go through a bunch of finagling, copying and pasting, but there's no real use for having more than one cover page. Now you notice on the cover page, it's got a place for the document title and a place for a document subtitle. And it if you don't either erase or type something in those places, then when you print the thing out, it'll say those words, document title, document subtitle. So I can see up in the title bar, the name of the document is Section Breaks Mod 2 blah blah blah. That doesn't mean that's what the document title has to say. Maybe this document is about how to use Microsoft Word for various methods. Now I'm noticing up at the top of the screen, the name of the file is Section Breaks. But maybe what the document is about is using Word 2016. So I'm going to click in the document title, and I'm going to type that in as the um, title for this document, using Word 2016. You can see in this case it's set up to use all capital letters. You can change that if you want, but that's kind of cool. And then for the document subtitle, if I've got one, I can put it in there, like uh, my byline has my name in there. Or if I don't want to put anything there, I just have to delete key and get rid of it. I'm going to put away. Um, let's see. So if I do a print preview right now, we'll actually have that document subtitle thing there. So what I'm going to do is try to totally delete it, tap in the delete key, and then maybe even um, click on the subtitle little name there, and delete that one more time. Then I Away, I'm left with just a little paragraph mark, and that's not going to print. And again, as I go to File, and Print, so I can see a print preview, I see the words that I put in there, and I don't see any subtitle. So get rid of that subtitle, it was a little bit difficult, I kind of had to delete it twice. Right. So that's your job now. You're going to insert the cover page. And if you want to try a different one than filigree, definitely feel free to do that. Just make sure that every one of the placeholders either is deleted or has something in it. So we're going to go insert the cover page, everybody. If you haven't done that recently, this would be a good time to go and save all of your open documents. And then let us start a brand new document. I mentioned this next thing in Module 1, but maybe not everybody has actually checked out Module 1, so let me just mention it here. I want to start a new document. One of the ways to do that is to go up to my File tab. Here in the backstage view, I can say, I would like to make a new document. And then it offers me a whole bunch of really cool ways to make new documents. For certificates and calendars, and just all kinds of stuff that's in there. It's taking like a second to catch up to me. And in there I can say, oh, what I really wanted was a blank document. But if I know that I want a blank document, then I can actually do that a faster way through a keyboard shortcut. The keyboard shortcut being Control and the letter M as in new. Not Control and the end key. That would take me to the end of my document. So I want control and the letter M for the document. And you just take a second and catch up with me, and I'm probably zoomed in a little bit more than I want to be. So okay. control M to make a new document. Go do that on your screen right now. 
But I'm going to do some typing, and as I'm typing, I'm going to be making mistakes. And some of these it will catch automatically, and some of them I'll have to do a little bit of extra work to get it to catch the mistakes. But the reason it will catch some of them automatically is because of what I'm about to show you now. You don't have to do this on your screen, you're just going to watch. So I'm up here going to File, and then in the backstage view, I'm going to click on Optional ones right down here in the corner. And um, when I choose something on the left hand side, it changes things on the right. And I want to talk about proofreading, also called proofing. So on the left side, I'm going to click on Proofing. I'm going to scroll down just a little bit, and I want to talk about these things right in here. So, so automatically, Word 2016 is set up to check your spelling as you're typing, mark grammar errors as you're typing, find frequently confused words and mark them somehow, and check the grammar and the spelling at the same time. So that's why some of the things we're going to see are going to happen right here. I click on OK. So uh, you just peek, peek behind the curtain. Don't ignore the man behind the curtain. Sometimes you need to peek behind the curtain. OK, so you're going to see me typing some stuff, and then I'll leave it on screen, and you can repeat what I did here. First one is going to be kind of a simple one, like uh, my car uh, are green. Now it doesn't seem to have caught the word R, but as soon as I hit the enter key, sometimes that's enough to get it to trigger catching the thing that was wrong. Right. We'll talk about what to do that in just a moment. I'm going to keep typing now. Let's let this company go about, and I'm going to misspell about, A B U O T, about its. And uh, so I want you to watch a special thing that's going to happen right here. I'm going to slightly mistype business. B U S I N E E S, what it really should be E S S. And when I hit the period, did you see it? Fix it. I typed E E S, it typed E S S. Again, we'll talk about why that happens in just a moment. All right, I'm going to hit the enter key. By the way, that was called auto correct. Oh, now it finds something about the it's that it doesn't like. So while you're typing, it will catch some things. Other things, it waits until you hit the enter key or a space bar to catch your problem. And some words, it just fixes right away, and you might even not notice it that it fixes. My first job was at McDonald's. So when you worked at McDonald's, they would show you these training films on how to do things. And one of my favorites was the training film about building Big Macs, because it had some just classical uh, subjects in it. So one of the things that they would say in this video, I'll never forget it, uh, you're working on a Big Mac, and so you've got a toaster that has the three-section bun for the Big Mac. So it's got the bottom, it's got the middle, and then it's got the Mac crown. Yes, that's what they call it. So one of the steps in the uh, video for making a Big Mac was put the Mac crowns on the Mac buns. That was my favorite phrase in the whole training video. Put the Mac crowns on the Mac buns. And then you send them to the front because that's the last step. So put the McCrowns on the McBuns. When I hit the other key, it seems to catch something about the McBuns. So I'm going to leave this on screen. I would like you to go to your window and type things the way I did. And remember, when you type in business, try to type an E E S. And as soon as you like, type the period and hit the other key, and it might not even wait that long. It might just fix it while you're typing. So again, I'm going to leave this on screen. You're going to catch up with me, put the video on pause, and do that stuff. By the way, I'm from the Detroit area originally, and right across the uh, Detroit River is Windsor, Ontario. So we would do a lot of business and talk to people from Canada, and so this would be kind of the way that it, that it would sell. Let's let this company go and do their business, uh, but they would not spell it this way. Information you need to know about me. So let's see what we can do about these things that it has found. I'm going to go up here and point at the R green, and I'm going to right click on it. And in the pop-up stuff that appears, I've got the little mini formatting toolbar. And then down here at the bottom, I've got stuff for down here about spelling and grammar. And so it's suggesting that I should use the word is, but if I click on it, it'll replace it. Maybe I'd like to figure out a little bit more information about what's wrong with that word. Um, I'm going to slide down here and click on grammar. That opens up a little window pane over at the left side that says, all right, here's the word that's wrong, here's what we're suggesting. And if I click on change, it'll just fix it. Or if I want to read more about it, I've got a little arrow down here that I can click on and scroll down a little bit, and it's telling me what's wrong with it. 
The subject and the verb should agree in numbers. They should be singular, or they should be both singular, or they should be both plural. And they've offered me some suggestions that are not about licensing the word here, but like here's what we're talking about, here's some examples. Right, so in this case, I do want to replace it with is, I just click on change right here, and it does that, and it hides that to a little mini panel that pops up. So, so you try that. You can uh, uh, right click on it, and in the little pop-up that appears, you can just click on is, or if you want to read more about it, click on grammar, and then read about it, and then click on replace. Right, let's move on to the next one. So for each of these, you're putting the video on pause so that you can try it out. Let's talk about the next one. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to right click on let's. And this time they don't seem to offer me the little extra thing about grammar, but they do tell me, oh, it should be like this and then it pops up. By the way, if it's not really misspelled, then I'll have this thing about uh, ignore it. Oh, we'll see some other choices in a minute. So I'm going to click on let's with an apostrophe. And there it fixes that one. And then I'm going to right click on a boot. And it offers me choices that are like that one. And we'll talk about, so where did it get these choices from? Well, I got it from something called the Spell Checker Dictionary, which is just being mentioned down here. So I'm going to click on the better spelling of a boot. By the way, early on, building computers, they thought they would be able to teach computers how to spell relatively easily. They would give it a bunch of rules, and they'd let it get some experience, and that way it would learn. And eventually they got to that. Any of you who watched Jeopardy, where they had the, uh, the big uh, blue computer playing against humans. So eventually they kind of worked that out. But imagine I'm initially trying to teach a computer how to spell. Like, I want to give it some rules. But here's one that you've probably heard along the way. If you have a word with an E and an I right next to each other, which one could, would come first? Okay, computer, I'm going to give you this rule. I before E. There we go. And some of you in your head right now, you're saying, yes, uh, except after C. Right, so now i got to go in and give it the rule about, okay, I before E. Oh, there's an exception here, computer. Except after C. And when I talked to my father about this years ago, he said, well, the way we learned that rule went like this. I before E, except after C. Except on sounding like A, as in neighbor, in G-I-G-H-V-O-R, or way, in E-I-G-H. So now I'm in there saying, hey, computer, I before E, oh, there's an exception to the rule, except after C, oh, there's an exception to the exception to the rule, and, and they, you know, eventually kind of gave up on that for a while. And what they've done in the office suite is give it a spell checker dictionary. Now, this is not a dictionary with definitions. They do have one of those. It's called the thesaurus. But the dictionary is just a list of about 100,000 correctly spelled words. So that's where it got the better spelling of about was from that spell checker dictionary. All right, next thing that I'm seeing here is it's with an apostrophe. And right click on that, it says this one should be done without an apostrophe. The only time you should use an apostrophe is if it's short for it is. And in this case, that's not that. Let's let this company go about it is business. No, so I need it without the apostrophe. All right, put the video on pause, and you try that. All right, now come to the Macrons and the Macrons. So I'm right-clicking on the Macrons. I'm having a little trouble figuring out what this should be. Microns, Macrons, Crons, Macnons. Man, I don't even know what that word is, but it's in the spell checker dictionary. So if this is a word that I use a lot because I work at McDonald's and I write documents about McCrowns, then I do have a choice to actually add it to the dictionary. I'm going to do that right now. Uh, by the way, it would be a really good idea if you had it spelled correctly in the first place when you add it to the dictionary. Otherwise, you've got to figure out, so how do I get it out of the dictionary and then fix it? Well, while I'm just mentioning it, let's, let's talk. Let's see. So I'm going to go up to the View tab. And I'm going to slide down here to Options. And I'm going over here to the proofing tools. We were looking at this a moment ago with the check spelling and all that. And right here, so see, we've got some custom dictionaries. And so I'm going to click on custom dictionaries, and it shows me a couple of them. And one of them, if I zoom in on it, it's named by Roman Custom Dictionary. It says that's the default place where it would store these kind of words. So with that one selected, I have a choice over here at the left hand, or excuse me, at the right hand side, that says I would like to edit that word list. So I give that a click, and then here is my special word list. And if I misspell it here, I can delete it. 
notice there's not all the hits in there. So if I'm realizing, oh, I misspelled that one in the first place, and I want to remove it from that spell trick and dictionary, I can select it here and then delete it, and I'm going to do that. And OK a couple of times. In fact, OK twice. So now it's misspelled again, and, uh, and I don't have any better better phrase for that. So we can do the same thing with McBuns. By the way, the red scribbles are not going to print. So if this is just a one-time thing and you don't want to add it to the dictionary, leave the red squiggles there, and that's fine. Right. So, uh, so try that out. Right-click on the word McCrowns and add it to the dictionary. And then to remove it from the dictionary, you go to File and Options, Grouping, Dictionary, Top Default Dictionary, Edit the word list, click on the word, and delete it. So that's your job for the next couple of minutes here. Put the video on pause and go do all of that stuff. All right. Now I mentioned that there are some things that it won't necessarily find on the first pass through, but there's another way to get it to kind of start over again. I'm going to go up here to the review tab and click on that. And then I've got a choice in here about misspelling and grammar. And I'm going to click on that. Right now it starts wherever my cursor was and checks forward from there. Here are words that are in the spell checker dictionary that I found. And I'm going to say, no, I don't, don't really want to do any of those. I'm just going to say, ignore all for the moment. And then it finds this one that's wrong. I'm going to say, yep, ignore that one as well. And now uh, it says, all right, that spelling and grammar check is complete. Sometimes it will find things that it didn't find um, previously. So I'm just saying, um, after you fix the things that it found automatically, Run that spelling and grammar checker again. And then one more thing that's really important, there are still things that it won't find. You still have to eyeball your document and go through it and see if there are things that it didn't find that you would like changed. So you still need to go through and check things by eyeball. And it's kind of nice to feel like somebody's watching your back. In this case, word itself. I mentioned that there were a couple of other things we were going to talk about, so let's look a little bit more about the proofing tools. For example, uh, let's say I'd like to find a different word for the word company. So I'm going to go just click in the word company to put my cursor there. I don't really need to select the whole thing, as it turns out for this. And, and under my review tab, where I was doing spelling and grammar a moment ago, that pulled things in from the spell checker dictionary. And I said that dictionary doesn't really have definitions or synonyms, the thesaurus does that. So I'm going to click on the thesaurus. It opens up a little control panel over here where it is now showing me synonyms for the word business. Um, corporation, firm, concern. And then as I scroll down some more, it says, oh, there's another definition for the word company, and it's companionship. And so sometimes they'll have the noun version of it, they'll have verb versions of it. They'll have multiple, um, you know, sort of versions of a word and uh, words that you can substitute for that. So let's say that I would like to change this to corporation. I am tempted to just click on corporation because that's what I did when I was running my spell checker or my grammar checker. But watch what happens when I click on corporation. I can do anything over here. What it's doing instead now is looking up synonyms for the word corporation. Oh, this is one of those. It's company. Yeah, okay, there's a big circle. So um, if I want to go back and look at company again, I can either click on company, or there is a little arrow here where I can go back to a previous one that I was doing. Click on the little left arrow, now I'm looking at company. So how do I get corporation in there in its place? The secret in this case, the little pull down arrow. I see a couple of choices called insert or copy. Alternatively, if I right click, on a corporation, I will see those choices on insert or copy. Copy means take this word corporation and put it on the clipboard waiting to be pasted someplace. If I wanted to replace the word company right here, then I would use insert instead of copy. And that's what I'm about to do. Insert. There we go. Now we have the word corporation instead of company. All right, your turn to try that. So you're going to go click anywhere in the word company. You're going to click on the thesaurus that opened up this window. Find a word over here that you would like to replace it with. I would recommend don't use the word business, because that would say, well, let's let this business go about its business. I know, I guess that can be kind of cute, but, um, you know, be careful about those kind of things, too. Well, okay, so you're going to go do that. Put the video on pause and get it to replace company with corporation, please.
Okay. I'm going to introduce the new kid on the block here, Smart Lookup. It says, learn more about text that you select by seeing definitions, images, and other results from various online sources. Now, this is a brand new one here. Let's say we all just have a car. We have a Mercedes. So lucky. Then I'd like to look up the word Mercedes using the Smart Lookup. One way to do that is to right click on it. There's a choice about Smart Lookup. The other one is to just go right here. They're both going to do the same thing. They're going to open up a new panel over at the right side. Smart Lookup. So Got two tabs up here. The one defined says, so, yeah, I don't really have a, uh, another word for Mercedes. But Explore tells me about Mercedes Benz. Got a Wikipedia article about it. Got some pictures from Bing Images. And some more websites that I can click on to actually go to the Mercedes Benz um, website and learn more about the different Mercedes that are available. The green ones and the other ones as well. Well, give that a try. Give yourself a Mercedes. I wish we could actually make that happen in this class, but I believe it. I have a Mercedes, and then click in it and do the smart look up and see this new thing up here. Talk to you in a minute. Anyway, welcome back. So I'm going to hide both of these little um, task panes at the right side. I'm going to hide the insides and hide the thesaurus. I want to talk about a thing that we saw happen here, where I mistyped the word business and it didn't flag it, it just fixed it. That's something called autocorrect. And we're going to see that there is a list of commonly misspelled words and their better spellings. And it can be used in a couple of different ways. And we're going to see. So I'm going to click right at the end of that last sentence and I hit the enter key. And I'd like you to watch it do a couple of these. Uh, I want to, I don't want to type the word the, except I mistype it, T E H. You see me typing T E H. When I get the space bar, it says, oh, you found that T H E. If I'm just typing along and I misspell it like that, I won't even see it fix it. It just does it. So I went to the store and, I'm going to misspell it A B M, and I bought a Mercedes. The store there. So that was a couple of examples of something called autocorrect. Now maybe you have words that you realize from your experience that you commonly misspell and you'd like to add them to that dictionary. There's also a couple of other things we might use this for. So first of all, let's go see what this um, what this autocorrect list looks like. So I'm going to go up here to a file, and I'll give you time to do this in a minute. You know how it goes, you watch me first, then you try it. So I'm going up to File and Options. I'm going back to that proofing section. We were talking about the custom dictionaries, the things that it automatically is looking for. And then in the upper right corner, here's the bad boy I'm looking for right now, autocorrect options. I click on that. Here comes a list. So here at the top, we have things that it's looking for all the time, like two initial capitals. Here's an example of it. Or if I type a sentence and I haven't capitalized the first letter, it'll do that for me automatically. We've all had this happen where I've accidentally hit the caps lock key and it's typing everything in reversal. Uh, it can try to look for those things and automatically fix it while you're doing it. Also, as I move down a little bit here, it's got um, a list on the left side, it's the misspellings, and on the right side, it's what to change it to. For the moment, I'm going to just scroll down in there. So I'll zoom in a little bit. So, about the should be replaced with about space the. And again, these are auto correcting features. You type it this way, it automatically types it this way. So you could go up right in here and type some word that you know you commonly misspell, and then type the better one in here. You might have to go like look it up in the dictionary first to see what the better spelling is. But this way, you could create you know things on this list of your own. You know, type in the bad one, type in the good one, click on add, and it would now be in this list. Um, I kind of scroll past a couple of things that were in there that I should go back and talk about for a moment. So, so if I want to make a uh, copyright symbol, I can type parentheses around the lowercase c, and as soon as I hit the space bar, it'll replace it with a copyright symbol. We've got the 
old school slimies in here. So you can take all the old school slimies and it'll fix it up in the new school slimy. But there are other things that I've seen people use this for. Let's say that I work for Dr. Normal Knockalocker. And I'm supposed to sign his name at the end of every document that I send out to his customers. And so I'm always in there, and how do I spell lock and locker? So I'm going to set a thing up. So maybe I'll just uh, type Dr. K, like well, maybe even just DRK. By the way, these need to be letters that you would not normally just type in the course of typing a normal document. At least not these three letters and then a space. So I'm going to type in uh, DRK as an abbreviation for Dr. Knockenlocker. And then on the right hand side, I'm going to spell his name in there. Dr. Knockenlocker. One more step to do here. I'm going to click on add. Now let's see if this is in action. I'm going to OK my way out of here. Let's see how the last down here. So I'm clicking on OK, OK twice, and now I'm going to put in his name. D-R-K, I hit the space bar, Dr. Knockenlocker. And you can set up a thing so that when you type a couple letters, it could type your name. I can see that it's got a little problem with Knockenlocker here. What can I do about that? So that it wouldn't flag his name, assuming I spelled it right here. Remember how we could add it to the dictionary? I could right click on it. Add it to the dictionary. Again, make sure you spelled it right the first time, otherwise you gotta go and remove it from the dictionary. Alright, so I would like you to try that. Again, the way we got there was file, options, proofing, autocorrect options. So you type something on the left, you type the better thing on the right, add it to this list, and then go check it out. So All of those little windows. I want to tell you a little story about the uh, autocorrect feature. So we don't have to do the same thing. We go up to File and we choose Options. Then we go to the Proofing. Then we go to the Autocorrect Options. So one of my fellow teachers is a guy named Alex. And he has a good friend who's also a teacher here named Jim. So Alex was sent to a company to teach one day, and he knew that Jim would be there the next day. He set out to sabotage Jim. He set it up so that the next time somebody typed J I M, it would type Big Fat Hairy Idiot. And he knew Jim would know how to fix it. Uh, he also knew Jim would be in a hurry in the morning, like typing stuff up on the screen. Hi, I'm Jim, and you know, this is what we're going to teach you. Um, so it said it went off just like clockwork. Hi, I'm Big Fat Hairy Idiot. And everybody, there's this like big uh, gasp in the room. And he had to look up to see where we were gasping, and he knew who had done it. He said, Alex. So they both tell us the story later on. I suggest that you do that to any of your co workers. So, okay. A little bit of a brain break. I don't need this document for anything more, so if we just finish the, uh, the previous section here, um, feel free to close this document. So, one way to do that, I go file, and close. Ask me, do I want to save it? And I will say no thanks. So, let's open another file here to play with for our next subject. So, we can go to File and Open, or you can use Control O. Going through File and Open. To this window, I'm going to go Browse. And we're going to go take advantage of the fact that I made a little shortcut over here. So I'm I'm go over here and click on my word sample files. I'm going to scroll down a little bit. I'm looking for one named Finding Text. Finding Text for Mod 2. I'm going to double click on that one. Um, finding Text. You know, so up here at the top, it says this is open in protected view. Unless you need to edit it, if you're just going to read it, then just read it. If you need to edit it, then you'll have to click on Enable Editing. You may have seen this happen earlier in your experience here. So I'm going to click on that, and here I am now in the document named Finding Text. So pause the video, go open that document, Finding Text, please. So I'm going to use the Find command up here. I'm going to click on that. that by the way, as I'm hovering over it, it might be tough to read, but it says the keyboard shortcut is Control-F. 
either control F or click on the word find, opens up the left side navigation pane. Last time I was here was in another module where I was looking for the words chapter 3 in a document. Notice in this document it doesn't find any chapter 3. But uh, maybe I would like to look up the word gallery, find where the word gallery appears. Oh, I'm going to type that in right here. G A F L. That's what I'm typing, it starts looking. The more I type, the more specific it gets about what it's looking for. And it automatically highlights all the occurrences, and if there's a bunch of them, then it shows me little shortcuts to them over here. And scrolling up and down, hovering over this one, it says that one's on page one. Scrolling way the heck down here, hovering over that one, it says that one's on page four. Apparently, we're gathering in here just a whole bunch of times. Now, maybe I want to replace that word just once with some other word. Well, we've seen we could do that through the thesaurus, for example. Or maybe I want to replace all occurrences of that word with something else. A classic use for this would be, we've got a bunch of documents for a company, where the company name is mentioned in the document, and then the company gets sold, and now the company has a new name, and they need to go back and rework a bunch of my documents to go find the old name and replace it all with the new name. So uh, we do have a couple of different ways to replace things. Let me go up here and click on the little pull down arrow next to the word gallery. I've got some choices in here about, for example, do I want to find graphics in my documents? Do I want to find footnotes in my documents? Well, not what I want to do right now. What I want to do is replace the word gallery with something else. I'm going to click on replace. And now it opens up the find and replace window. By the way, I could have done that by clicking on replace up here to start with. So now uh, it says gallery, and then down here I'm going to tell it what word to replace it with. Or I can either replace it once and then find the next one and decide about replacing that, or I can replace all of them. Also, as I look down here under the more, I've got some other choices down here about do I worry about uppercase, lowercase? Do I want it to only find places where gallery is the whole word, or do I want to find other words that are like it, like galleries, that would be all word forms. If I don't look for whole words only, then it will find words inside each other. Um, this makes me think of a, um, of a old joke that uh, Stephen Colbert was telling on his show one night. He was reading an article that said a famous political figure had been buttonated. And he said this was an example of find and replace gone wild. The person, it said, had been buttonated. And so, so I'm thinking, so what would that be about a spell checker? Maybe he was assassinated. They got a spell checker looking for one of those words and putting in the other one, and suddenly he was buttonated. And Stephen's answer to that was it probably happened with a pledge alt rifle. Anyway, moving on. I get real specific about how I want it to find certain words, and do I care about the uppercase, lowercase, that kind of stuff. And maybe I want to replace the word gallery with uh, show place. That's not really appropriate for the word gallery here, because we're talking about these kind of galleries up there, the styles galleries and so forth. That's a very official name of those. But I'm going to say, in my case, yeah, uh, replace the word gallery with the word show place. So I'm going to click on replace. And somewhere in the background here, it uh, replaced the word gallery with a show place, and now it has found the next one. And I'm going to say, okay, you replace that one. And now that one's a show place, and now it's finding the next one. And if I just don't like that word at all, or it's that one case where the new company has bought out the old company and I need to replace them all, then I've got a button for that, replace all. That said, it found 71 replacements for gallery, and obviously mentioned a lot in this document which is okay, and then I'd like you to try that thing you have just seen me do. I'm going to close this window. So again, the way I started that was I went to the find command, that opened up the navigation place over here, navigation pane, and said look for the word gallery. I trouble finding the word gallery. I can see galleries down here, so you know, I might need to go in there and say they find all versions of the word, but Right now, all of the words gallery have been replaced with that other word. But that's how we got started at it. Once it found places with the word gallery, we clicked on this little pull down arrow, said I want to replace. We told it to replace gallery with show place. You can click on replace, it'll do them one at a time. You might need to grab the title bar to move it out of the way. Um, and then maybe try and replace all, and then decide how many it finds.
on your turn to use the find and replace feature of Microsoft Word. Working along, we've got several documents open right now. If you can play along with me, why don't we take a moment and close all the documents we have open as we close them and ask us if we want to save them? That will be up to you, but we probably have saved them recently, so we probably won't ask. So let me go up here and uh, click on my close button up in the upper corner. So it says, Oh, save the changes to finding text. I'm going to say, Yeah, go ahead and save that with the replacements. All right, so do a two large document and then close that one the same way. You can also go to File and choose Close. All right, a uh, keyboard shortcut for Close the Document, I believe, is still Control W. So the file and then I'm closing this one. Do I want to save it? Section breaks for Mod 2, sure, I'll save that. I'll just close that. Eventually along the way, probably as you get to closing the very last document, you're probably going to see this. You have all the styles or building blocks, such as cover pages or headers. In our case, it's a footer. And if I want that footer to truly be available for mod and other documents, I need to say, yes, yeah, save that modified building block that I made for a footer. I'll look at that. You are probably going to see that along the way here, if you were playing along with me when we made that footer. Alright, let's go restart Microsoft Word then. Offer me those templates right away. I'd like to try one of these. I'd like to try the personal letterhead. Now yours might not be just right up here in the top row. You have to scroll down and look for it a little bit. I wish the list was alphabetized, but I'm afraid I can't say that. Let's scroll down and try to find one called personal letterhead. It should kind of look like this. Go ahead and click on it. I'll show you a little preview of it, and then you're going to click create. Okay, take a moment. I should pop it up fairly quickly. So, so it's taken who I'm signed in as, throw that up here. Got little placeholders for street addresses and so forth. But right now, so I try to click on the uh, placeholders for the street address and so forth. It seems to be a little tough here. I'm trying to click on it, I'm getting nothing. If you will double click on it, you'll discover, oh, well, that's actually up in the header, and that's why you couldn't get to it first. But now you can. You can modify wherever you want to. So, put the video on pause and do what you saw me do. Open up that template called the personal letterhead. It'll show you a preview. You'll click create. You should be where I am, and then you can double click up here for the student address, and you'll be in that place. So, look at the template there, everybody. So, you can do here, modify the street address, your telephone number, your email, those sort of things. So that way that would be in this document the next time you open it. One of the things that's cool about a template file, I'm sure that we've all done this. I need to make it a document this year that's very much like a document that I created last year. So I'm really tempted to open up last year's document and type in the new information, the new location of the party that we're inviting them to, the new price of whatever thing I'm trying to sell them. And then, if I make this mistake, if I go up and click on the save button, what have I just done to last year's document? I just got it. I've replaced it. Microsoft would say, you have updated last year's document. I have a little different name for that. I would say, you have stomped and folded and mutilated last year's document and replaced it with this year's document. One of the cool things about a template is, you can modify it, add new things to it, and then when you click the save button, it will not destroy the template. It will create a brand new document every single time. Then we'll come back and talk about, well, what if there are certain things that I want in there every single time? Maybe I'll make a template for myself. So we're going to look at those two levels of using templates. All right, so uh, if you want to take a minute and fill in your street address and telephone and that kind of thing, go ahead and take a minute and do that now. I'm not going to do that right now, but feel free to do that if you like. You want to pause and then come on back. Let's imagine that I have done that, and now I want to use this template for a particular thing. So I'm going to double click down in the regular text, it's now in a header. So as I can click to select a date. Hmm, select a date. I click on it, I get a little pull down arrow here. There's something called a date picker. So it has today's date in there. I can click on today and put that in there. If I want to send the letter next week, so I can put you know, next week's uh, uh, date in there. So far, I just click on today, I click away, there it is. 
as today's daily letter. Says, Dear recipient, right? So um, I'm writing this letter to a particular person. And you zoom in a little bit. So dear Dizzy Gillespie, there's a bunch of text down here that I probably don't want in there, but you know, just a little placeholders for how the thing would look. And so now I'm going to fill in the information that I need uh, Mr. Gillespie to know. So I am dragging across the things that I'm going to change. And maybe this is going to be sort of a standard form rejection letter. So we have reviewed, reviewed your application to our trade show. Use my spell checker dictionary trade show. One that your products are offered. Offer. We apply different products if you wish. Notice I see the red scroll there. If I stop my typing and go fix it every time I see a red squiggle, it really slows me down. So a good habit to get into is just keep typing. You don't want all that squiggle to go back and fix it at the end. So please reapply with different products you wish. Here we got water regards and my name is it. Now I'm going to go back and right click on any mistakes, grammar and spelling mistakes and so forth. Fix them up. And now this document is ready to go. So I can actually just click save. I don't have to worry about save as because I'm starting with a template. So I'm going to go to file. I'm going to choose save. Browse for a place to put this. I don't want to put it on my corporate home drive just yet. I'm going to click on browse. And notice right now it's ready to make a Word document. And it's not going to write over top of the old one, my template. So I'm going to save this Word document. Maybe I'll put it in my finished documents folder that I created for my lessons. I'm going to drop it right in there. And I'm going to call it uh, Gillespie Rejection Letter. So I'm going to try to fill in your name, your student address, and so forth, put in today's date, write a little letter to somebody, maybe make it a rejection letter. And then click the Save button, put it in our finished documents folder, and name it something appropriate for what text we filled in there. And I left off at the end of the previous lesson. We had just used a template to create a document. And uh, one of the big points of why we would use a template is we can modify the document and choose the Save button. And you're not destroying the original. The original is still showing the original. So I'm going to close this one document right now. And then I'm going to start Word again. So the next time I want to use that particular template, it should be a little bit higher on your list now. You can go click on Personal Letterhead Template. I'm going to create it. A little faster way to double click on it. So it's creating it right now. 